token five. Do you identify? Negative. <laughs> Welcome back to another episode of Logan Fizzle, where we unflinchingly dive into deeply challenging topics, including religion, politics, and history. Today, we're honored to host a truly distinguished guest, Rabbi Yaakov Shapiro, an emeritus pulpit rabbi with over three decades of leadership, an acclaimed author, and a venerated voice in the international dialogue on Zionism and Judaism. Rabbi Shapiro embarked on his remarkable journey in religious and philosophical studies straight out of high school, swiftly becoming a protege of some of the most esteemed rabbinic scholars in Orthodox Judaism. His profound understanding and incisive analysis have been channeled into several influential works covering tops ranging, topics ranging from the nuances of Talmud Talmudic law to the philosophical underpinnings of religious belief. Notably, Rabbi Shapiro authored The Empty Wagon, Zionism's Journey from Identity Crisis to Identity Theft, a monumental 1,381-page exploration, currently in its sixth printing, that dissects the complex interplay between Zionism and Judaism, heralded as the most authoritative text on the subject to date. His insights have reached millions globally, challenging and enriching the discourse on a topic of immense theological and geopolitical significance. Today, we'll be discussing the intricacies of Zionism, Jewish religious thought, the ongoing Israeli-Palestine conflict, and what these dynamics mean for the wider world and humanity as a whole. Rabbi Shapiro, with his unparalleled depth of knowledge and unique perspective, promises to enlighten us on these critical issues. So sit back, subscribe if you haven't already, and prepare for a conversation that promises to be as thought-provoking as it is enlightening. Rabbi Shapiro, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me, and thank you for that uh, really generous introduction. You're very welcome. I'm just trying to think where to start. Um, so recently, Candace Owens, in an interview with Rabbi Barkley, uh, just had a, a, a big um, clarifying discussion about some allegations made by him against her as being an anti-Semite. Uh, I've been uh, watching Candace Owens for a while, and I noticed lately that she kind of went out of step with, uh, you know, the, the Daily Wire's uh, heavily pro-Israel position, uh, notably, you know, started by uh, Ben Shapiro. And uh, she had, uh, I'd been actually a little bit concerned about her because she was exploring some areas that seemed to be probing the edges of some dangerous topics. For example, you know, although she's talking about the Israel-Palestine conflict, she's also, you know, been talking about, you know, what kind of books did Hitler burn? And I'm just thinking that seems a little uncomfortably close. So I was wondering if she was going to, you know, step into some trouble when uh, she had that conversation. And she surprised me and she actually stood her ground quite well against the allegations made against her. And uh, the reason I bring that up is because uh, part of that conversation with Rabbi Barkley was uh, defining what anti-Semitism is. So, um, so I'm just going to play a little clip here. And we can see what that says, and then we can maybe see what you have to say about that, Rabbi. Could you okay, provide so for us a definition of anti-Semitism? I, absolutely. I really appreciate that, because I think that is the break. If we're not speaking the same language, where can we go, mm -hmm. right? So there's a man, um, a blessed memory man named Lord Jonathan uh, Sachs. He was the chief rabbi of England. He had a great line. He really defined anti-Semitism, uh, that, that anti-Semitism is Jews have no right to exist collectively as Jews with the same rights as other human beings. By the time you get to the 18th and 20th centuries, when so many Jews have assimilated, they are in culture, they are in arts, they're in science, it's no longer against them for their religion, it's against them for their race. Because anti-Semitism is the oldest hate in the world and the hate that mutates. In 1948, because remember, it's Lord Sachs. Oh, I just want to pause it. You said it's a hate that mutates. Correct. So your belief then is that the definition of anti-Semitism can necessarily change. Is that correct? It's not just my belief. It is the commonly accepted understanding in both the Jewish and academic worlds. Okay. This isn't, okay. As I said, that's why I quoted, this is a quote. It's a great thing from Lord Sachs. Uh, you know, Jonathan Sachs, it's a great thing from Nyaleka. This this is just accepted as 
the understanding of, you know, a cultural okay. anthropologist. So I, I would just say off the bat, I do not accept that definitions can just mutate. That is something that I, mean, I could debate that on, like the definition of a woman. I mean, and I'm saying not just about Jewish people. I think that we have to have a concrete definition to work with because then you can just update and say, actually, I've changed that. Mm-hmm. And now this is what constitutes Candace, anti-Semitism. But Candace, that is the horror of anti-Semitism. So um, I don't know if you've seen this yet, uh, Rabbi, but uh, do you have any thoughts on uh, this so far? Um, no, I haven't seen it. I don't really follow celebrities and I hadn't heard of this rabbi before I just saw that clip. Um, I, would you be able to play where the rabbi or somebody there actually does give a definition of anti-Semitism? Because so far she asked him a question to define it and he says the definition changes and she said, well, the definition can't change, but has any, did anybody give it the definition or a definition? Uh, so he was actually citing um, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, and I, I happened to make a little clip of Jonathan Sachs's uh, definition. Uh, so I can share that right now. We can take a look mm-hmm. at that. We can go directly to the source because I was curious, you know, that they were talking about it. And I thought, well, what what does, you know, Sachs have to say? Is he still living? I don't know. I don't know how long. No, he's was. not. Uh, but uh, let's uh, let's find that clip and we'll we'll take a look. First, let me define anti-Semitism. Not liking Jews is not anti-Semitism. We all have people we don't like. That's okay. That's human. It isn't dangerous. Second, criticizing Israel is not anti-Semitism. I was talking to some children in Britain the other day, and they asked me, is criticizing Israel anti-Semitism? I said, no, and I explained the difference. I asked them, do you believe you have a right to criticize the British government? They all put their hands up. I said, now, which of you believes that Britain has no right to exist? None of them put their hands up. Now you know the difference, I said, and they all did. Anti-Semitism means denying the right of Jews to exist collectively as Jews with the same rights as everyone else. It takes different forms in different ages. In the Middle Ages, Jews were hated for their religion. In the 19th and early 20th century, they were hated because of their race. Today, they are hated because of their nation state, the state of Israel. It takes different forms, but it remains the same thing. The view that Jews have no right to exist as free and equal human beings. The new anti-Semitism has mutated so that any practitioner of it can deny that he or she is an anti-Semite. After all, they say, I'm not a racist. I have no problem with Jews or Judaism. I only have a problem with the state of Israel. Anti-Semitism means denying the right of Jews to exist as Jews with the same rights as everyone else. The form this takes today is anti-Zionism. Of course, There is a difference between Zionism and Judaism, and between Jews and Israelis. But this difference does not exist for the anti-Semites themselves. So, um, there was a part in there where he says that uh, it mutates. And uh, the reason I included that in the clip was because that was one of the things that uh, Owens was uh, discussing with with uh, Rabbi Barkley. So I just wanted to put that in there for completeness sake. So how are we doing so far? Does that make sense what he's saying? Or do you, do you find that you made different? No, it, it didn't make, I'm sorry. It didn't make any sense at all. Not in the slightest. First, first, he, d- he made it, he gave a definition of anti-Semitism and it says that he said that it means that Jews don't have a right collective can't should not be able to exist collectively with equal rights as everybody else which means that if you don't believe that you should take away the rights of the jews you just hate them all you're not an anti-semite what if you hate all jews because they're jews but you don't believe that you should take away their rights you believe they have a right these hated disgusting people because they're jews for no other reason than the fact that they were born jews 
they have a right to exist like any other normal human beings. They have rights, and you shouldn't take away their rights, but you hate them because they're Jews as Jews. You're not an anti-Semite. I noticed that. Well, it was one of the yeah, first. I like, think he, well, he opened with that, right? You know, I'll, I'll tell you why he did that. Okay. Okay. Let's go, let's go to the end of his uh, statement, and then I'll explain why he made that silly statement at the beginning of it. He said that anti-Semitism changes, that first they were, Jews were hated or opposed because of their religion, then because of their race, now because of their state, right? Which means that he's assuming that in all three cases, when you hate Jews because of their religion, you hate Jews because of their race, you hate Jews because of their state, you're hating the Jews. They're just three different reasons. So right there, we don't need to say that the uh, anti-Semitism, the definition mutates. All we need to say is that reason could change. Uh, let's use the common denominator between all three of his um, types of anti-Semitism. And I don't know why anybody didn't think of consulting a dictionary. Um, the anti-Semitism is the opposition or hatred or dislike of Jews as Jews. Cod Jews because they're Jews. Very simple. If I don't like you, there may be a valid reason or an invalid reason. I may not like you because of some choices that you made. I may not like you because you're a crook. I'm, I'm just making this up. Don't be insulted. I don't mean you. I don't even really know your name. But um, I may I may not like you because of we'll something. We'll just blame it on my frames. Oh, no problem. I don't, I don't, you, know, you know what? I may not like you because you're tasting frames. Um, I may not like you for various different things. Um, all those are legitimate reasons not to like somebody. Except maybe the taste in frames, uh, so you have a yeah, taste, but it's not like sure. a reason to hate, you know? Sure, sure. Any choice that you make, uh, a choice that you made that could have been something else, and I say, no, you did a bad thing, and therefore you are a bad guy. Very simple. You have bad ideas, therefore you're a bad guy. You said bad things, therefore you're a bad guy. You made bad choices, therefore you're a bad guy. Thing, your choices are things that are judgeable. I can judge them. I can say I can make a mistake. I could make an incorrect judgment, but I'm entitled to judge you by virtue of your choices, by all the choices that you make, right? I could say they're evil. I could say they're bad. I could say they're stupid, which is also a judgment. I could say they're smart. That's judging somebody. I don't have a right, however, to judge you on things because of things that you had no choice in, your skin color. Uh, I could judge you and say, yes, you're black, but that's not a judgment. That's an observation. If I say I'm judging you, I'm judging you as a person because of some immutable characteristic that you have, your skin color, your nationality, your gender, whatever, that's wrong. There are right. certain unjudgeable characteristics that a person has, judgments that you are not entitled to to make certain things that are unjudgeable about people and certain things that are judgeable. If I judge you for something that's an unjudgeable characteristic, that's hate. It could be racism. It could be misogyny. It could be anti-Semitism. It could be all sorts of things. And the bottom line is that it looks, there are a lot of people who don't like my religion. A lot of people don't like any religion. There are people who think my religion is silly. They're atheists, some of them. Now, they're not anti-Semites. I say they're untutored, but they're not anti-Semites. There are people who don't like my religion because, I don't know, they don't like animal sacrifices, or they don't like uh, the way Judaism looks at women in their perception. Mm -hmm. Now, again, those are ignorant people, but they're not anti-Semites. But if somebody doesn't like a Jew just because he's Jewish without any other thing, could be he's not even a religious Jew, he's an atheist himself. You just anti-Semitism is you don't like Jews because they're Jews. Now, what excuse do you give? Well, you can define a Jew as a race. You can define a Jew. You can say, I hate the Jews because of their religion. Now, look, if I say that 
there's somebody has a satanic religion and I think that they're satanic people, that's not hate. That's I'm perfectly entitled to do that. There are satanic religions out there. If somebody, however, without knowing about Judaism or deliberately makes an excuse to say the Jewish religion is supremacist or the Jewish religion has these things in the Talmud, which I've seen these neo-Nazi quotations from the Talmud that are don't exist out of context, even books of the Talmud that don't exist, books, actual quotes from books, the books themselves don't even exist. The Libra David, I think, is the name of one of them, if I remember correctly. So then, of course, then you're making an excuse, but you're really an anti-Semite because really you just hate Jews because they're Jews. Okay, now. I could see a, a situation where maybe somebody sees that propaganda and they don't know that it's fake and they might fall for it. I think that's a, a legitimate trap that a person so, can get pulled right. into. So that's the same as, for example, uh, I know plenty of people that came out of Russia, the Soviet Russia, and in Soviet Russia, they were taught in school how terrible democracy is and how terrible capitalism is. And it was all lies. What they were taught was not true. They told me crazy things that they were taught. So they are accidental haters not on purpose. Such a person is ignorant and his ignorance leads him to hate and he is an anti-Semite, but not by his own choice, right? You could be a murderer because you think somebody's trying to kill you. You could be a hater because you think somebody deserves to be hated. It's that simple. But it's not nothing complicated about this. Uh, uh, racist, let's say, against black people is because he doesn't like black people because they're black. You don't have to say I'm taking away their rights. Being black is not a judgeable characteristic, right? And an anti-Semite is somebody you don't like a Jew because he's a Jew. Now, I, this is not my definition. And this rabbi over there said, well, it's accepted by academic world. And it, it, at the Jewish world, <laughs> that was I, another I, side question. Jewish, I have no idea what he's talking about. All I know is that even the Zionists, if you look at the Zionists' old Hasbara handbook, okay, I'm not, you know, Hasbara. There's a handbook Zionist. for it. Okay. There, is, there, are, there are a few, actually, uh, a few of them leaked. You can get them off the internet. Uh, you could probably download it still. If not, contact me. I can uh, hook you up. But in the Hasbara handbook, it says, you don't like Jews Ka Jews, Q U A, as Jews. You don't like Jews. that's anti Semitism. Now, this, however, however, this idea that Rabbi Sachs said at the end that if you don't like Jews, let's say because of their race, now Jews aren't even a race, Jews come in all races. Um, there are black Jews, there are white Jews, there are Yemenite Jews, there are brown Jews, there are converted Jews. Ivanka Arab Trump is Jewish. A Arabic Jews? Arabic, absolutely, Arabic Jews. Um, there are Jew Jews are not a race. Jews are a religion. You could be a Jew uh, regardless of your race, regardless of your gender, regardless of your ethnicity. There are Chinese Jews, you know? So... As I said before, if you make up a fake Jewish religion in order to hate Jews, you're really an anti-Semite and with an excuse. If you make a fake race of Jews in order to hate Jews, you're also an anti-Semite, right? Besides which race is not a judgeable characteristic, even if being a Jew was a race, okay? So you're an anti-Semite no matter how you look at that. But... He said then that now they hate Jews because of their state. Mm -hmm. Okay. If somebody hates members of a state because of the way, because they support a state that acts bad, is that legitimate? Well, that's, that's a, that's an interesting question because, uh, you know, in in the in the Gaza conflict right now, I think there was someone quoted as saying that there are no innocent Palestinians or no innocent okay. civilians. Okay. Now, Rabbi Sachs may say that that's racist, but the person that said it is saying, "I'm not saying he's right. He's not." But what he claims is that look, there's a evil regime, the Hamas, 
and anybody that supports it or anybody that doesn't object to it is complicit. Now, they're wrong for so many reasons. Even if the theory is right, the theory meaning that if you do not object to an evil regime, you're complicit. That's the application to what's going on today is, is absolutely wrong. But if somebody says, look, Israel is a, a bad actor and anybody that supports Israel therefore is complicit. That's not anti-Semitism. He may say that, well, they're liars because uh, the, Israel is not a, a bad actor. And he may say it's just an excuse. Okay? I, I can't speak for him, but I'm just trying to figure out what he would say. Now, we don't even need to go there. He said later that although they hate the Jews because of their state, he said nowadays the anti-Semite has a new uh, privilege, so to speak, that he never had previously. Now he could say, I don't hate Jews, I just hate Israel. Right. Here's the question for him. Does this guy that first he said they hate Jews for their state, then he said, I don't hate Jews, I just hate Israel. Well, which is it? The, this anti-Zionist that he's talking about, does this guy, is he one of the guys, there are plenty of them out there, that say, I have nothing against Jews, we don't have anything against Jews, we just hate Israel. That's different than saying I hate all Jews because of Israel. I think something that complicates that is the fact that the state of Israel is named after the people of Israel. Well, hold on a moment. Sure. Okay? Yeah. I don't want to go too far moment. ahead, but you see where I'm going with okay. that. Okay. Well, look, there's a big difference between somebody says I hate all Jews because of their state versus I just hate Israel, I don't hate the Jews. Now, you can name Israel whatever you want. If somebody names Israel Yaakov Shapiro, that doesn't mean if you hate Israel, you hate Yaakov Shapiro. Right, right, right. Right? Uh, if you hate America, that doesn't mean you hate Amerigo Vespucci. Right? Just because you named it after. So, but there is a complication in there that I'll get to in a moment. So I don't understand what Rabbi Sachs is saying. The difference between anti-Zionism being the new anti-Semitism versus all the other anti-Semitisms is all the other anti-Semitisms that he mentioned and those that he didn't mention are involve somebody who says, I hate the Jews. Just there are different reasons why I hate the Jews. Here, this guy is saying, I don't hate the Jews. I do not hate the Jews. I just don't like Israel. I hate an ideology called Zionism. You are allowed to hate an ideology. An ideology is a judgeable thing. Any ideology, whether it's religious or secular, any ideology, anything that ends with ism. Right. You're allowed to say, I would I wish it would disappear off the face of the earth. I wish communism would disappear off the face of the earth. I wish capitalism would disappear off the face of the earth. I wish feminism would disappear off the face of the earth. These are all claims that people could make. And they're either correct or incorrect. They could either be silly or intelligent. They could be ignorant or or uh, scholarly. But it's not hate because you're judging something that's judgeable. If I say I don't like North Korea, that doesn't even mean I don't like the North Korean people. I'll tell right. you, I wanted the Soviet Union to go out of existence. I wanted it to go out of existence, but I had nothing against the people of the Soviet Union. So what Rabbi Sachs said, he asked those students, well, you have you criticize the British government, but you don't but nobody here would say Britain has no right to exist. All right. Let's assume I'm going to get more into that later because that whole statement, I mean, I, I, I don't have enough fingers to count how many errors were made in that logical and factual errors were made in that uh, statement itself. But. If somebody says, I don't want the Soviet Union to exist, I wish it would be replaced by another regime, is that anything wrong with that? If no. somebody indeed no. would say that, you know, I don't think that Britain should exist, meaning Britain doesn't have a separation of church and state, Britain has a monarchy as as unfunctional as it actually is, you know, as symbolic more than anything else, it doesn't matter. Maybe they say, you know what, 
I believe that every country should have a separation of church and state. And if there's a Church of England, if the chief rabbis, one of, one of them was Jonathan Sachs, by the way, is an employee of the state, such a mm. state should not exist. So he, he's uh, partisan there as well. Yeah. 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 Right. There's nothing wrong with that as well. Right. If that yeah. state, if England wouldn't exist, he wouldn't have a job. But if um, there's nothing wrong with that, if somebody says, I don't think North Korea should exist as it does now, it should be replaced by a different regime. Is there anything wrong with that? No. no unless, so unless, said, unless you're on, on the side of North Korea. Unless you're, well, the, yes, but it, it's, it's a, a valid opinion it could be right it could be wrong again it could be all sorts of uh you can say all sorts of things about the opinion but it's not racist it's not uh hate right um i'm for now just for the for the sake of our conversation i'm going to throw all these different types of hate these invalid types of hate under the rubric of racism i'm going to call them all racism anti-semitism right. will be a part of will be a type of racism okay just for the sake of our conversation. It's not racism if I say, you know what, I think that England should not exist because it should have a separation of church and state and any such country should not exist. If I say a country should not exist, then it should be replaced by some other regime or some other type of government, a uh, government where there's no, uh, where there is a separation of church and state, where there's no communism or whatever I say, there's nothing wrong with that. Okay. Number two, I don't know what it means in general about countries having rights to exist. Right. People have rights. If if I can jump in there for a second, I do actually have uh, a little clip from my last uh, my last interview with uh, uh, Michael Rechtenwald, who's a libertarian, and we were actually talking about this very thing. And uh, I was kind of trying to tiptoe around it because you know you, you have this inflammatory rhetoric around Israel has a right to exist, and uh, he actually came back with this, and I I think uh, I think he's okay. right on the, on the point here. So if you could just give me a second. Look, no states have rights. Okay, let's is, let's get down to a libertarian perspective. There is a state doesn't have. There is no state. States don't have rights. Only individuals have rights. And so to to assert states' rights is is false. It's a false premise. There's no such thing as a state having a right to exist. People have a right to uh, exist, of course, and they have a right to associate with each other in in ways that they would like. So they have the right of association. They don't have a right to impose uh, their own uh, statism on a region in which for 1,300 years a people had lived and owned and harvested and homesteaded, as we put it in libertarian terms, uh, particular properties. So they didn't have the right to expel those people that they did. There wasn't all expulsions, as we know. There was a lot of it was property that was purchased, and then there were expulsions. Uh, there was terrorism, uh, early terrorism on the part of the, uh, the Zionist uh, contingent. And then there was counterterrorism. This is true. Uh, so all of this went on. It's, uh, you know, it's a thicket, really. And uh, but yeah, the, the principles are that the state doesn't have a right at all. That no state has a right to exist. There, when did a state, this abstract entity, get endowed with rights? Where and how? Right. Uh, I, I mean, did Czechoslovakia have a right to exist? Did uh, Soviet Russia have a right to exist? East and West Germany have a right to exist. The whole concept of rights only apply to people. And so, however, I, I know where they got this from. I, I remember there was this French philosopher, Ernest uh, Renan. Uh, he, I just looked him up again. He invented some idea that countries have rights to exist. I quote, the state has a right to exist when individuals are willing to sacrifice their own interests for the community it represents. It's different than self-determination. It was like part of a whole philosophy. But the way the Zionists are using it, the way it's being used now has nothing to do with that. It was just, I, I think they probably just lifting the words from there and, and applying it over here. But states don't, right, only people have rights. States don't have rights. What the, so let's throw that, throw that phrase away. Let's talk about, sh the, uh, as Rabbi Sachs said, should the country not exist, okay? There's nothing wrong with saying a country should not exist. 
per se, in and of itself. There's nothing wrong with that. I guess it's how how it comes about, perhaps. Well, well, obviously, obviously, if you say, but you want to drop an atom bomb on a country, you're not talking about the country existing. You're talking the problem there is that you, the fact that you said you want to kill people. Again, it's not a country existing. It's the people. The fact that the country doesn't exist isn't the problem. It's the fact that you vaporize all those people. Now, um, let's get back to Rabbi Sachs, okay? So sure. Rabbi Sachs is conflating not liking Jews because of their whatever versus liking Jews, just disliking Israel. In all his examples... You don't like Jews because of their race. You don't like Jews because of their religion. You're saying, I don't like Jews. Here, you're saying, I have nothing against Jews. I just don't like Israel. I wish Israel would not exist. In the other cases, you say, I wish the Jews wouldn't exist. I wish they wouldn't be Jews. In the case of anti-Zionism, you're saying, I wish Israel wouldn't exist. And Sachs himself used this as the quintessential example of what uh, of what's wrong with anti-Zionism as if you would say, well, I don't think Britain should exist. And therefore, his comparison, his, his pattern, his changing of definitions fails because in all his previous cases, in all cases of anti-Semitism, based on any dictionary definition, it means that you don't like Jews. You can tweak the words and say it unlike Jews because they're Jews. You don't you, you oppose Jews. You don't like them. You have negative feelings towards them. However, you want to tweak the words, but it has to be Jews are the ones that you don't like or you don't oppose or that you hate. And, and in all his examples, it was like that. It's just a question of why, because of this or because of that. Bottom line is you don't want the Jews to exist or you want them to change their religion. You don't want them to exist as Jews. Here, you say I have nothing wrong. I have no problem with the Jews existing. I just don't want Israel to exist. So it's not. It doesn't fit into his pattern of anti-Semitism. Uh, when you say the definition changes, it doesn't really change. It's still the same bad feeling towards Jews. And this is semantics already. It's just a question of why you don't like the Jews, okay? And, and the truth of the matter is, it's not anti-Semitism that changed its definition. It's the word Jew that changed its definition. Anti-Semitism doesn't change the definition. What happened over there is that back in the olden days, everybody understood, including the Jews, uh, for the record, that Judaism is a religion. In the, about the 1800s, there came up this new idea that Jews are a race. That's what changed. The idea of, of what a Jew is changed. I was going to say that that seems to be something that's a bit of a, a, a murky area for some, because you can have a, an atheist Jew whose mother well, was Jewish, but he, I'll, he's, I'll, he's not theologically Jewish, or you can have uh, someone who's theologically Jewish, but not this, who converted and is not, uh, not, not from a lineage that's Jewish. No, no, I'll, I'll explain that. I'll explain that in a moment. But this whole idea that Rabbi Sachs is saying that anti-Semitism changes, that means to say that the definition of a Jew is static and anti-Semitism changes. But what he's describing is the same phenomenon throughout all of time. You don't like Jews because they're Jews. Now, what's a Jew? Well, a Jew is somebody with the Jewish religion. You don't like him because that. Well, uh, you can't say, you couldn't say uh, 500 years ago, I didn't like the Jews because of their race, or a thousand years ago, I didn't like the Jews because of their race. There was, first of all, races weren't uh, a thing then, but the Jews didn't look at themselves. People didn't look at the Jews as a race. So it's not that you hated them for their race. Um, then when there came this idea, this anti-Semitic idea that the Jews are a race, it still says, it's the idea of anti-Semitism is still you don't like Jews, but you change the definition of Jew. Imagine misogyny, okay? Misogyny is definition, you, you don't like women because they're women. If you change the definition of a woman, you just change. Misogyny didn't change. The word misogyny didn't change its meaning. The word woman changed the meaning. Right. Candace but, Owens actually brings that up too. <laughs> well, well, but precisely that's what's yeah. happening. Anti Semitism. See what, so, so now what Rabbi Sachs wants, what did he say at the beginning? He said at the beginning that uh, to take away the Jews' rights, they shouldn't be like all the other people. 
That's what he said. Right. And I asked, why did he have to narrow the definition of anti-Semitism to rights? Certainly, he would understand that you could be an anti-Semite without claiming that the Jews deserve less rights than everybody else. The answer is because what he wants to establish is that the Jews, like everybody else, have a right to a state. Right. And he didn't say that in that clip, but that's what he wants to do. He in set up pretty his, roundabout he, way, but yeah, set, that's yeah. He set up his definition of anti-Semitism in order to enable anti his uh, claim that anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. He seemed to have unnecessarily given a pass to a lot of anti-Semites, those who hate Jews but don't think they should have less rights. But he did that. Because he then enables the claim that anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. Because if you don't like the state of the Jews, if you say the Jews don't have a right to a state, you're an anti-Semite. Everybody else has a right to a state, right? Now, that claim is also not true. Because first of all, not everybody has a right to a state. I'd like my own state. I'm a left-handed person. I'd like left-handed people to have their own state. It would be great. You too? I, okay. Yeah. I remember it was when we had the dial phones. It was it was terrible. I uh, it was hard to dial the phone. You know those barber scissors. It's always backwards. Um, there are so many tools that uh, are made for right-handed people. We are. I'm an oppressed left-handed person. If only the left-handed people would have their own state, govern themselves, and be a majority. I uh, no question that right-handed people would have civic rights, or civil rights in my state, but they wouldn't have self-determination rights. They wouldn't let them become a majority because then they'd vote my rotary phones, yeah. my, my rotary phones out of out of business. You remember the emergency brakes on a car? So that was yeah. good to be a lefty when it was on the left-hand side. And the toll booths, you could always throw the change into the toll booth, the exact change lane. Uh, without without stopping the car, even if you just slowed down, if you're a lefty, it was it was much more fun. But that's the idea. There's no such thing. No, states don't have rights. Yes, I'm allowed to say any state shouldn't exist. And yes, um, not everybody has a right to a state. Um, the idea that the Jews' natural development, a maturity, ends up in a state of statehood is also based on the definition of a Jew and the Jewish people, which you touched on, and I'm going to get there in a moment. But there is no world in which it makes any sense that anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. Are there anti-Semites that are against Israel because they're anti-Semites? Of course there are. Are there anti-Semites that are for Israel because they're anti-Semites? Of course there are. There are, in, in fact, uh, the alt-right Richard Spencer, he had said that he, there was, a, there was a clip of him, Texas A&M University, he was speaking there. And uh, after he makes his racist speech, so there's a rabbi that gets up in the QA and asks him a question. You see him from the back in the clip. He's wearing a yarmulke and he's holding a, a book. And he says to Richard Spencer, something to this effect. You are preaching radical exclusion. Judaism preaches radical inclusion. Would you learn and love or something like that? Would you learn, would you learn Torah with me? And he shows him the book. It was apparently a Jewish book. And anyway, this Richard Spencer, he says, really? You, Judaism preaches Radical inclusion, would you like to include everybody in Israel? Would you like all the different nationalities and, and ethnicities and everybody to move into Israel from the Middle East? Of course not. You made your own ethnostate, and I respect you for that. And that gives you a sense of, of identity, and you've kept your identity. You've kept your identity strong by making a state only for Jews. I respect you for that. And that's what I want for my people, the whites. Okay? and the, that, That's a theme that I've heard, and I have some clips that touch on that. We can get into that later. 
Right, so there are anti-Semites who are very happy with Israel. They actually use it as a model. The same Richard Spencer said on an Israeli television show. He said, I consider myself a white Zionist. You know that uh, you're speaking now uh, with uh, Jewish journalists. Uh, most of our viewers are Jews. How should we, how should I feel? As an Israeli citizen, someone who understands your identity, who has a sense of nationhood and peoplehood and the history and uh, of an experience of the Jewish people, you should respect someone like me who has analogous feelings about whites. I mean, you could you could say that I am a white Zionist in the sense that I, I care about my people. I want us to have a secure homeland that's for for us and ourselves, just like you want a secure homeland in Israel. Right. He said, you guys should respect me. He said the Jews should respect him, the Zionists, at least. He says, I, I, I consider myself a white Zionist. So it makes no sense that anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. These guys that don't like Israel because they don't like Jews, fine. That's they're anti-Semites because they don't like Jews. Israel needs to be looked at at most like a Jewish institution, a synagogue, a yeshiva. It's possible you don't like the behavior of this particular synagogue. That doesn't make you an anti-Semite. If this synagogue or this yeshiva is behaving badly, then they deserve to be judged as behaving badly. And if it comes to the point where you believe, you know, close it down, it's incorrigible, that's possible, right? Um, then the, that or the constitution of the synagogue is made in such a way that it ensures bad behavior or whatever, something like that. Then you'd have to rebrand it you'd have to transform it into something new the same way we transformed let's say soviet russia into soviet union into a a new regime right that's not anti-semitic because you're judging this particular institution these particular people or that particular the bylaws over there for what they are for their choices and israel is just one big jewish institution at most it's no different than if you dislike this particular yeshiva or this particular synagogue or this particular Jewish organization. I don't like the ADL. I tell you now, I wish the ADL would not exist. They have no right to exist as they exist now. Okay? Does that make me an anti Does that make anybody an anti Semite for saying that? No. Let them change. Let them make new bylaws, new staff, new mission, new. Way of oper- way of operating, and I'll be okay. Just like I'm okay with North Korea changing their regime into something else. I don't want to drop an atom bomb on it. I don't want anybody hurt. The corporation, the operations, should not exist the way they do. That's it. Israel is just another Jewish organization. That's it. Nothing more, the, nothing less. What about the argument that it's the only Jewish state? Versus the first of all, so let, let's ass- okay continue the thought. So, and therefore what? Therefore, I'm not allowed to judge them as not as being incorrigible if I feel they are. Therefore, I'm not allowed to say they're behaving bad. What am I not allowed to do if there was another Jewish state that I would be allowed to do if there was another Jewish state? So imagine there's five Jewish states, okay? Now, I'm allowed to say I don't want number four to exist. But now number four stops existing. Number three stops existing. Number two stops. Now there are only two Jewish states. uh, And now there's only one Jewish state. Tell me what am I now not allowed to do because this is the only Jewish state. Tell me, like, what what would make sense? Hmm. Are they less judgeable? No, there's no such thing. There's no logical arguments to say that there's some sort of immunity to the same judgment that every institution, every person, every organization in this world has. So, no, there's no logic to any of these arguments. If every institution, every country as a country, every institution as an institution, every person as a person um, can be judged for their choices for the way they act, the way they think, 
Again, it could be it's a wrong judgment, could be it's mistaken, could be it's overly harsh, could be it's even it's even oppressive. But that's not racist. Racist is when you judge something that you're not entitled to judge. You're not entitled to hold somebody responsible for. It's wrong. It doesn't make any sense. It's wrong. It's morally wrong to say because this guy has more uh, color in his skin, therefore he's bad, or therefore he is predisposed to be a crook or whatever you're going to say. That doesn't make sense. Literally, by the way, that's dehumanizing somebody because the difference between a human being and an animal is that a human being has choices, has free will, and animals don't. Uh, that's the teaching of Judaism. Um, and if you say that because that this human being has less free will than other human beings because of the color of his skin, so you are literally dehumanizing him to whatever extent you say, well, he doesn't have a choice because he's black, he's going to grow up to be a drug addict. Well, because he's Jewish, he's going to grow up, he's going to rob somebody, he's going to steal somebody's money. You're literally saying that this person is born with less free will than other human beings, which literally, literally means that you're, he's less of a human being. But set that aside for now. Let's go back to Israel being a Jewish state and the definition of Jew. You can have atheist Jews, yes. You can have atheist Jews. Um, and every religion has its rules. The rule of Judaism and the definition of somebody who is a Jew is different than, let's say, Christianity or Islam, uh, because our origin story is different than that of Christianity and Islam. In Christianity, so Jesus comes and he makes claims he's the Messiah, or he's the Son of God, or whatever the claims are, right? Anybody who follows his ideology is a Christian. Anybody who doesn't isn't. So if you have an atheist, or somebody who doesn't believe in Jesus, he's not a Christian by definition, right? Right. Islam is the same thing. Yeah, Muhammad came. Uh, the ideology is that he's uh, the last prophet, it's, et cetera. Uh, his word is, uh, the Quran is uh, the word of God. If you believe that ideology, then you're a Muslim. If you don't, then you're not. That's not how Judaism started. The Jewish origin story is in the Bible, the Old Testament, where the Jews were gathered at Mount Sinai after they left Egypt, and God came to them and said, I am the Lord your God that took you out of Egypt. Here are the commandments that you have to follow. And they agreed. They agreed, not only did they agree, our tradition tells us they agreed to take it upon themselves, uh, them and their children and children's children. In fact, one of the commandments, not in the Ten Commandments, we believe there are 613 of them. The Ten Commandments are just categories. In fact, between me and you, the, the phrase Ten Commandments isn't even Jewish. I don't know who made it up. Aseris Hadibris, we say in Hebrew, Ten Declarations. Um, the idea that there are Ten Commandments, I honestly don't even know who did it. It wasn't a Jew. I mean, it's not a Jewish uh, a Jewish phrase. We just use it, but uh, it's not, you know, to be taken as, you know, technically uh, technically binding. That these, I heard some people say, though, there are only ten. Where did you get the other 603? Well, Ten Commandments, we don't call them Ten Commandments. In any case, God came and said, you people out there, here are the commandments that you must, you and your children and children's children must fulfill. Our tradition also tells us that the uh, souls of uh, the as yet unborn Jewish people were there and accepted the Torah as well. So it's not just, it's not an ideology that a man came and said, and, and there with an ideology that he's a prophet or he's a son of God or he's something. And if you follow him or his ideology, then you are a member of that religion. The Jews became the members of the Jewish religion were created then by the entire Jewish people at Mount Sinai. They accepted upon them and their children and children's children. And therefore the definition of a Jew is somebody who is commanded, even if he doesn't fulfill them commanded, to fulfill those 613 commandments. And we have very precise laws as to who is. If your mother is Jewish and your father is not, you are commanded. If your father is Jewish and your mother is not, you are not commanded. If your 
that you convert. You can convert to Judaism because Judaism is not a racist thing because, uh, again, you can convert. Ivanka Trump is probably, you know, the world's most famous convert these days. She has no Jewish blood. Her father is Donald Trump, right? How could you get less Jewish than that? Um, And just as the Jews at Mount Sinai accepted the Torah, anybody can do it now. Once you're Jewish, you cannot convert out of Judaism. That's Jewish law. The other religion that a Jew believes he converted into will accept him into their religion. Let's say he becomes a Christian. The Christians will say, now he's Christians. The Jews will say he's still a Jew, meaning he's commanded to fulfill those commandments, obligated to fulfill those commandments. Wherever you have the word Jew, you can put in brackets, erase the word Jew, and replace it with somebody commanded to fulfill the 613 mitzvahs, commandments. That's it. That's all it means. You can have an atheist Jew. Sure. Uh, let's say, let's define um, a policeman as somebody who's, let's say he applies to be a policeman. He now has a job description, right? And even if he never comes to work, he maybe even believes he's not a policeman. But if he signed up, I think the French Foreign Legion is a better example. You signed up. You're in it. That's it. Okay. Those Jews uh, were deputized by God into this religion. So even you're not a Jew because you eat bagels and lox. There's no such thing as Jewish food. This bagels and lox thing is the Jewish Ashkenazi culture, uh, Eastern Europe, uh, Poland, Hungary, uh, Russia, Germany. Um, but the Jews of Syria, Morocco, they don't know, never heard of gefilte fish. My daughter married a Jewish guy. His father is from Turkey. His mother's from Morocco. She makes Moroccan salmon every Shabbos, not gefilte fish. She makes both sometimes. But a Moroccan salmon, it's a salmon in tomato sauce with chickpeas. Uh, The Syrian Jews in Brooklyn, there's a large community of Orthodox Syrian Jews from Damascus or Aleppo mostly, or their, their grandparents, and they speak Arabic. They don't speak Yiddish. They speak Arabic as their mother language, and they use Arabic phrases. They refer to Hashem as Allah. They don't say, Emirza Hashem, God willing, the way I do. They say, Inshallah, because they grew up speaking, they grew up, their parents, grandparents grew up speaking Arabic, and they had a religion of Judaism. Um, You go to a Jewish neighborhood, an Orthodox Jewish neighborhood, And you go to the Jewish restaurants, you'll find mostly pizza and sushi, much more than, I don't know what, chopped liver or something. That's just like, uh, there's no such thing as Jewish anything, anything that you attach the adjective. It's like saying there's uh, Buddhist food. That's right. That's exactly right. Now, the reason there could be atheist Jews is because the definition of a Jew, according to the Jewish religion, is somebody who is obligated to fulfill the commandments. And even if he doesn't believe he is, he's still Jewish. Now, the problem is, if you ask this Jewish guy, what makes you Jewish? And he's an atheist and he doesn't believe my story. He doesn't believe the biblical story. What's he going to say? Now, here's where Zionism comes in. So, but, but just, just for a second, so what makes him Jewish if he doesn't believe he is? Because his mother was Jewish? No, well, no, because, well, he's commanded to fulfill the 613 commandments. By, by what convention? Uh, by the fact that his soul was there at Mount Sinai, and we know this because his mother was Jewish. R- okay. So, so, ba- so because his mother was Jewish to shorthand. Right. Well, there's a difference. Because his mother was Jewish sounds like it's some kind of hereditary thing. It's not hereditary. It's not ethnic because ethnicities follow, first of all, according to Jewish law, all familial affiliations and tribal affiliations follow the father, not the mother. We are made up of 12 tribes. If somebody of tribe A marries a girl from tribe B, the child is follow his tribe follows the tribe of the father gotcha. regarding family familial inheritance and stuff all family affiliations all tribal affiliations follow paternal gotcha. lineage paternal. only gotcha. religion follows maternal lineage ethnicity follows both the mother and the father right there's no this is a religious doctrine the idea 
that if you're Jewish because your mother is Jewish, if you don't believe in the religion, there's no reason to think that you're Jewish because your mother's Jewish. What other uh, means could make somebody Jewish 100% if his mother's Jewish and 0% of his father's Jewish? It's not biology, it's not DNA, it's not um, ethnicity, it's not genes, it's not, it's not even family, it's not even tribal laws. And who made that tribal law? It's religious. It's religious doctrine. If you don't believe in religious doctrine, then at, whoever is a Jew that doesn't believe in the religious doctrine, ask him why he's Jewish. I can tell you he's Jewish if his mother was Jewish or there was a conversion according to the Jewish religion. So, for example, a woman who, uh, uh, expecting woman, a pregnant woman converts to Judaism, the child is Jewish. But is the child Jewish? Is he considered, she, he or she considered born Jewish? Or was that child considered converted together with the mother? Okay. The different, yeah, there's a big difference in Jewish law. If uh, sometimes people adopt a child from an adoption agency, from a non-Jewish family, and they convert the child when they're a minor. By Jewish law, if you're converted to Judaism as a minor, when you immediately become of age, meaning bar mitzvah for a boy and bas mitzvah for a girl, you have a right to renounce your Jewishness. That's the only case where a person can renounce his Jewishness because they never chose to be Jewish. Everybody else, even somebody born Jewish, their souls were at Mount Sinai. But if I take a baby and I convert him to Judaism, he didn't choose. He will get to choose, but only when he becomes of age and capable of choosing. Now the question is, if a pregnant woman converts to Judaism and has a baby and this baby comes of age, can they renounce their Judaism? Are they considered converted as part of the mother or are they considered born Jewish? It's a big disagreement amongst our scholars and therefore if any rabbi is smart, he will never convert a pregnant woman. He'll wait until the baby is born. But if these are this is religious doctrine and every little uh, jot and tittle of this religious doctrine is derived from various religious sources in the Bible, in the Talmud, in the other literature. But if you're not religious, go ask a not religious Jew what makes him Jewish. That's the question. You ask me what a Jew is, I just gave you a very precise answer. With precision, I could tell you exactly who's 100% Jewish and who's not. Sometimes I'll tell you I don't know, like in the case I just mentioned. Right. So I, I can know. see how... If someone is anti-Semitic, this these uh, call them rules would be confusing mm -hmm. and difficult to navigate. I know, I know even for me, it's a little hard to follow. Uh, even you, you've just explained it to me now. Uh, so I can see how, uh, you know, Rabbi Sachs um, can think that, well, people are just looking for excuses because if somebody doesn't know what a Jew is, they're just trying to like just aim a shot in a general direction because they hate that thing that they can't even define. Well, that's that's possible, and I'll tell you that the fact that if you don't believe in the Jewish religion and the biblical story, then let's say you're not even a non-religious Jew. Let's say you're not you're you're a non-Jewish atheist. Who are these Jewish people? What are they? Where'd they come from? It's a mystery, and that mystery, and, and more than just a mystery. So who are they? They're these mysterious people that claim this, in their minds, bizarre and obviously mythological origin story. They stick together. I have to stick together. The truth of the matter is I have to, because if I... I need a neighborhood that sells kosher food and kosher groceries. I need schools for my children that have Judaic studies. So we, we need a community. We're, we're communal people in that sense. But they stick together and they're overly successful per capita. What's going on over here? And we were never allowed to own land or to go to the universities. So we were kind of forced into money lending and stuff which today means a mortgage broker, et cetera, right? 
all these mysteries and who are these people? Where do they come from? It sounds like a conspiracy group, kind of a secret society. That's why, you see, but back in the day, a thousand years ago, everybody knew what the definition of a Jew was. Everybody knew. That's why the protocols of the elders of Zion kind of anti-Semitism would never have existed then. There was Jews, there was Christians in Europe. Those were the only two religions, so they didn't like us. We, the Christians uh, persecuted us. We were killers of God, killers of, of the Messiah and, and, and stuff. They forced, forced conversions. And in those days, if you the wrong type of Christian, they could burn you at the stake also, right, for various different sins. And in for hundreds of years, Jews and Christians were the only religions in Europe. There was no critical mass of Muslims or Hindus or anything like that in Europe. So, yes, they knew we were religious, and that was the definition of a Jew, and the Jews always defined themselves like this. There was no such thing as a secular, non-religious Jew in the olden days. Maybe one or two quirky exceptions, you know, here and there. But by and large, there was no such thing. Today, the majority of Jews are not religious. Um. But then when everybody knew that a Jew was a religious person, somebody who followed the Jewish religion, so there was none of this secret society, um, uh, conspiracy theorist, Jewish an anti-Semitism. Because everybody knew Jews, Jews were a religion. Then after the uh, emancipation and the enlightenment, uh, there were people that didn't want to be religious. They wanted to uh, take, make, avail themselves of the new uh, privileges they considered privileges available to Jews. They threw off their religion, and they became assimilated. But they had a problem. <laughs> the problem is that uh, the anti-Semites attacked them, even though they were not religious. So I think that's sort of part you know, the second part of Jonathan Sachs' argument. I think the first part, you know, I think he was correct. He's basically saying that you know uh hating jews for being jews uh for their for their religion was anti-semitism which i would which i would agree to mm -hmm. uh uh but Nobody then the, sec the second that. part he went i think he said how race. you know race and i can see how there can be uh let's say um some partial correctness there because there is an apparent inheritance on the maternal side that might be suggestive of uh, of a lineage. Right. There is no lineage, but you there see what I'm no, saying. It, like there there's no, there's a, to, to to an outsider who doesn't quite understand. They know that there's a a fam family line. They always knew that a family line. Yes, but there is no race in the world that is handed down only maternally. There is no such race. Uh black, white, whatever, however you're going to define race. It's biological. There is no biological, maybe somebody will find one, believe me, the Nazis didn't know about it. There is no biological component that is handed down only from the mother. And you can convert to this uh, group, which clearly shows that has nothing to do with biology. So it's just, that's just an excuse. It, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, yes, yeah, somebody can say whatever they want. They could say that it's a race, and, but, but it, it doesn't really make any sense. People can say it, but it doesn't make any sense. What happened was that these Jews were persecuted anyway, and then there became a new definition of Jew. Put yourself in the place of these Jews that wanted to throw away their Jewishness, or they and they wanted to literally become like anybody else. Um, and guess what? The anti-Semites persecuted them as Jews anyway. There were pogroms, uh, late eighteen hundreds in Russia. And guess what? The new definition of a Jew became someone who the anti-Semites hate. The anti-Semite gets to decide who's a Jew. Theodor Herzl said that. Theodor Herzl knew that Jews for all centuries and centuries defined themselves as Rabbi Saji Gon, about a thousand years ago, he lived in Egypt. It means in English, we are only a people because of one thing, our Torah, the religion. If the Jewish religion would be 
removed from the Jewish people, there would not be any Jews. There's no such thing as Jews without a Torah. The Torah, being Jewish is a job description given by God. That's all. It's a job description. If you don't have, if you don't have a job description of being a policeman, that by definition, you're not a policeman. The reason Rabbi Sadia said this is to disagree with the Muslims. Then there were, the Muslims were saying that uh, God took away the um, Torah, the law from the Jews and gave it to the Muslims. As they call it abrogation. Some, some I may not be 100% exact in how I'm saying it, but something like that. That uh, the Jews now don't have the Torah, don't have God's law, now it's the Muslims who are given it. Kind of like a New Testament sort of thing. The new, the new covenant. Right, kind of like that, right. Right. Uh, I'm not an expert in Islam. You'd have to ask you know, one of them for the exact theology. But Rabbi Sadia says, I could prove to you that's not true. Because in the Bible, there are various passages that says that, that says the Jewish people will be here forever. We, we will never disappear. And he says, if God took away the law from us and gave it to somebody else, we're not Jews anymore. Because that's the only thing that makes us Jews is that law. Without that law, we're not Jews. So if the Jewish people are forever, they have the law forever. If you're a policeman forever, that means you have the duties of a policeman forever. That is all that connects one Jew to another, is the law, nothing else. And more than that, according to Judaism, closeness to God, which is the goal of Judaism, we're here in this world to get close to God so that we will remain close to him in the afterlife, and that's the everlasting uh, bliss. Long story short, you don't even have to be Jewish. Meaning, if somebody's not Jewish, I said the Jews are obligated to fulfill 613 commandments, right? The people who aren't Jewish are obligated to fulfill seven. Judaism is a universal religion. I believe It says that everybody in the world is obligated to fulfill seven Noahide laws, we call them. Um, can't worship idols, can't kill, can't steal. You have to set up a system of law, not necessarily Jewish, but some kind of system of civil law. I'm telling you as a rabbi that an average law-abiding Muslim that believes in Allah, the first cause, the necessary existence, that doesn't worship idols, doesn't kill, doesn't steal, fulfills those, uh, doesn't rip limbs off animals and eat it without killing it first. That's one of the laws, technically. He's closer to God, according to Judaism, than a godless heretic like Theodore Herzl or David Ben-Gurion. Being so, Jewish, so they were. They were. Were they? Were they atheists, or did, was did they just? Were they not observing? They were. Well, they were both not observant. David Ben Gurion said he didn't believe in the God of the Bible. He has his own idea of Godhead, but it's not the God of the Bible. He said that clearly. He said he doesn't believe that God speaks to prophets or anything like that. Moses heard God, but God didn't speak to him. That type of kind of like a new age kind of God. Um, but no, our, the the actual God that uh, created the world, no, he does not, he did not believe in that. You, he would, we can consider him an atheist if you like. Um, he would have to explain his conception of God, but it was not the Jewish one. Uh, Theodore Herzl uh, was an atheist too. And he actually, he preferred Christianity to Judaism as far as religions go. You know the old, there's a Jewish joke. What's the difference between Theodore Herzl and Jesus? What? Jesus celebrated Hanukkah. Herzl celebrated Christmas. Huh. He did. He had a Christmas tree in his house. His son converted to Christianity. He had an idea to end anti-Semitism by converting all the Jews to Christianity. It's in his diary. He had this whole plan. He's going to be the last Jew in existence on a Sunday afternoon that all go to a church with a whole bunch of drama. Um, so... These guys who didn't believe in Judaism, it's not just God. We have like 13 principles that if you believe in that, then you believe in Judaism. A reward and punishment, a God, the right God, etc. An average law-abiding Muslim is closer to God and will receive more reward 
than these godless heretics. Um, by God. He's closer to God than these guys. So, you know, Jew, again, being a Jew, it's not a club. It's responsibilities, 613 responsibilities. You could, anybody can choose to accept them, and then they're Jewish. King David himself, as it says in the Bible, the end of the book of Ruth, King David was a descendant, great-great-grandson of Ruth, the Moabite converts to Judaism. Plenty of converts. Some of their greatest Jews in history were converts. And all King David's lineage is of Moabite non-Jewish physical blood. But there's a spiritual component to a person. And if you accept the Torah, you are 100% spiritually Jewish. And that's all it is. It has nothing to do with anything else. And even honestly, even if being Jewish is uh, some type of lineage thing, is that an excuse to be an anti-Semite? Why does that make any sense? Why would that make any sense? Yeah, well, I, I think it's just I think it's just a way to maybe try to define and pin it down because somebody wants to understand what is this thing we're even talking about, right? But it's not, it, 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 you see, but you're not pinning anything down because if your mother's Jewish, you're Jewish. Okay, but what does it mean that your mother's Jewish? In other words, you're just kicking the can down a generation. A Jew is somebody with a Jewish mother. You cannot use the word you're defining in the definition. Right? You can't say, well, what's a car? A car is, well, a working car. Right. You can't say a cow. What's a cow? Somebody whose mother and father was a cow. That is not really, does not give you any information as to what that thing is. And so, too, if you say somebody's Jewish, if his mother was Jewish, you're not giving him any, he's not gaining any information by that formulation. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I just, I just want to sort of uh, maybe, because you're, 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 you're saying a lot of things and I'm, I'm following along. I know. Um, I'm not... um so we've gone from from Sachs's definition of anti-Semitism, and we've gone through, you know, uh, what is a Jew, I guess. Mm -hmm. So there's the religious, there's the Jew as religion, there's Jew as race, and then we've sort of been wading into the topic oh, of really, Zion, oh, Zionism. Wait, wait. There, there really isn't Jew as race. That's a fiction. Right, but what I'm saying, the, the, the idea of Jew as race. There's an idea of Jew as son of a devil. I mean, there's a do Jew all sorts of ideas. That doesn't mean anything. I, I don't just think... just speaking to Sachs's um, progression oh, of Sachs, explanation. Well, Sachs didn't say Jew as a race. He never meant that. Sachs said that they hated Jews as a race. He didn't say Jews are a race. Okay, I stand corrected. That's all. And if he did say that, the idea uh, of of the Jew as a race, uh, the idea. Yeah. I mean, you could have the idea of Jew as synagogue of Satan. Also, there are people who don't like Jews because of synagogue of Satan. I wouldn't put that as a definition of Jew, and I don't think Sachs would ever would ever say that. I don't. Th there's no way anybody could defend the idea of Jew as a race. It doesn't make any sense. Can a how can you convert to a race? And you tell me an Ethiopian Jew and a German Jew. Are of the same race? How does that make any sense? But doesn't that speak to his argument that the definition, the anti, the definition of anti-Semitism is mutates? How so? Well, because if to be a Jew is is not by race, and somebody's calling it by race. There, you know what I mean? The definition I mean, of the, the, the anti-Semites definition mutates. They changed the definition of a Jew. They could say, all, again, you know, somebody could say all Jews are sons of Satan. But the definition of a Jew or anti-Semitism doesn't change. It stays the same. I hate Jews because they're Jews. What your excuse is is another story. Right. That's a different story. But it's not that, as I said before, you can change the definition of a Jew. You could make up a definition of a Jew, uh, and it's there's a there's an empty uh, there's a empty space to fill with the definition of a Jew if you don't believe the Jewish um, definition. I mean, look, even if somebody's not a Christian, there was somebody Jesus, right? And he did 
have a following, and those people are Christians. There was a Muhammad, even if you're not a Muslim, and, and he did have a following in those followers. But if you don't believe in the Jewish story, what are you going to say? It just didn't happen. The Jewish origin story is either correct or it's a fiction. It's not that people made a mistake and followed Moses. It wasn't Moses that originated it. It's God coming at Mount Sinai to the Jews. So that's Moses was there 40 days and 40 nights, but you know, all the Jews heard God at, at Mount Sinai. And Hayoim Hazen, Ye Salam, today the Bible says you have become a people. And a people in those days means a society. Um, you have become a people. There's no political nations like we have today. The word Am in Hebrew means society more than nation. Um, when they say Am Yisrael, the Zionists would like you to believe that old phrase means the nation of the Jews. It means the society, not a nation. Uh, um, Kohanim, which are only one uh, part of one tribe, um, are also considered an Am themselves, a society uh in, in unto themselves. Uh, but definition of anti-Semitism is simply somebody who doesn't like Jews because they're Jews. It's that simple. If somebody doesn't like Israel, that doesn't make them an anti-Semite. If somebody thinks Israel shouldn't exist, it doesn't make them an anti-Semite. They could be. Could be if somebody thinks Israel should exist, that makes them an anti-Semite. They're doing, they think Israel should exist for anti-Semitic reasons because they think the Jews should be relegated to their own ethno state and let the America stay here for the whites. They could say that, which some people do. You could be for or against Israel's existence because of anti-Semitic reasons. You, but anti-Semitism means that you don't like Jews because they're Jews. It's that simple. Now, I, I want to address what Rabbi Sachs said about Israel having a right to exist, about criti criticizing a country as opposed to questioning their right to exist. Because, okay, Israel's a state of the Jews. How does Israel define Jews? Here's something a lot of people shockingly don't know because it's very open. Israel's not a religious country. Israel was based on Jewishness without religion. A Zionist, if you, you believe that you could be Jewish as a nationality, that's Zionism. Zionism is Jewish nationalism, but as opposed to, let's say, Christian nationalism, where Christian nationalists agree that Christianity is a religion, they just want the religion to be the uh, mover, uh, be, to control uh, the nation, right? They want the religion to control politics, um, Jewish nationalism said we disagree with the traditional Torah definition of a Jew. That's not what a Jew is. A Jew is a nationality, like a Frenchman, like a Spaniard, like a Chinaman. The problem is, and I, now the reason why they had to do this, they had to struggle to find the definition of Jew. They had this, this, I'm fast forwarding a lot. They had this business where these people who were not religious were persecuted as Jews. And the Theodore Herzl said, we're Jews whether we like it or not. Our uh, distress forces us to be Jews. He said, Herzl, the definition of a Jew is a person who the anti-Semites hate. The Jewish people are people who are, who are identifiable, who are united with a common enemy, namely the anti-Semite. John Paul Sartre, by the way, the French philosopher, said the same thing, that the anti-Semite makes the Jew. Now, what's weird about this is I once went to an anti-Semite, and I said to him, I'm not going to say his name, a famous anti-Semite, and I said, who do you, how do you know who to hate? I mean, how do, you, how do you define Jew? These guys are defining it based on who you hate, but how do you know who to hate? Would you hate that kid who was born from a converted pregnant lady who later when they got older, renounced their Judaism, would you still hate them? Would you still think that? How do you define Jew? And guy told me, whoever identifies as a Jew, I define as Jew. So you have these, these Jews saying, whoever the anti-Semite hates, that, that, that's a Jew. And the anti-Semites are saying, whoever identifies as a Jew, that's who we hate. It doesn't make sense. Zionism gave... Gave it some salience. It, it, yes, a, a tangible definition. But the problem is that definition made less sense than the race. 
And the race makes no sense. This this sets up a question that I wrote down, and and, uh, uh, maybe you can speak to it. It seems to be sort of in the ballpark here. Uh, In the discourse about Jews, we have come to take it as a given that they've been persecuted throughout history, of course, uh, especially given the unique atrocities of the Holocaust. However, this seems to have become so all-consuming as to have eclipsed other considerations. Are Jews too invested in their historical status as a persecuted people? And now maybe I should reframe that in terms of uh, Zionist uh, Hebrews or you know the, the Zionist definition of Jew. Okay, let's segue into that. So you have these people that are confused. Uh, I, that's what I call in my book, The Identity Crisis. We're not Jews because we're not Jews. We're not religious. We want to be regular Russians or Germans, yet the non-Jews don't let us be non-Jews. So what are we? There was an identity crisis over there. And part of what they had was the anti-Semite makes us into Jews. Now listen to this. The only, their identity as a Jew and their fates, because they're persecuted because of it, is due to anti-Semitism. It's not like me. When I, let's say I'd be persecuted by some anti-Semite down my block, let's say, right? I'm Jewish, I'm an American, I'm a human being. Uh, the fact that that guy persecutes me, it doesn't affect me except on how uh, that it's annoying, but it's his problem. It's not, it doesn't impact my identity at all. But to these guys who believe that anti-Semite defines the Jew, their very existence as Jews depended upon anti-Semitism. Without anti-Semitism, they are not who they are. It's their almost, identity. It, 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 it's a it, car. It, it, it it's becomes a, a dependency. A, a, a codependency, kind of, right? A dependency. But it's a dark identity. Imagine that. Growing up, thinking that you don't want to be, you're not really a Jew in the Jewish sense. You're only a Jew because people persecute you. Now, I'm sure you've heard various versions of this. I'll give you an example of one that you heard, and I want to play you a clip of another one. You've probably heard people say, well, non-religious Jews are equally Jews because Hitler didn't distinguish between the religious and the (laughs) non-religious. Okay. Now, Hitler didn't distinguish. Hitler now becomes the arbiter of who's a Jew. Hitler becomes the rabbi. Hitler decides if you're a Jew. I literally cannot think of anything more anti-Semitic than saying that the definition of a Jew depends upon what Hitler thinks. This is this is very interesting because it sort of it makes me think about how. Uh, the problem that we have with racism today and trying to undo it. So, for example, when we say, uh, you know, when Martin Luther King said, judge someone by the content of their character rather than the color of their skin. And so we say, great, so let's, uh, let's undo that now. But now what you have is a group of people who have inherited that persecution on the basis of a falsehood. Fair and so, and so, how do you undo that falsehood without um, perpetuating it by reversing that, it, flipping it over? It's, it's still, it's still part of that. That it, now you've turned it into a material dialectic, or something, you know, where something it's materialized into the problem is part of the, per, the of the future of of the solution, which means that it's never solved. That's or, an excellent uh, word, word, Worded that a little awkwardly, but you, I think you get it. I, I got it. That's an excellent question. Here it's worse because a black person is a black person whether or not he's persecuted. It's just a question of how you deal with this development of this persecution becoming part of the whole picture. Here, they're not Jews if they're not persecuted. Hitler decides who's a Jew. That means the anti-Semite, your enemy, the person that hates you and wants you dead, probably, he's the one that gives you your identity. That must be so traumatizing. Now, I'm going to play you a clip. I want to play a clip. Yep. This was a debate between Mayor Kahana and Al Dershowitz. Okay. Okay. Kahana asked Dershowitz, oh, excuse me, it wasn't even Kahana, it was the moderator, asks Dershowitz the same question that I posed here to all the non-religious Jews. What makes you a Jew? You're not religious. Right? You tell me what your definition, I know my definition, 
I say you're obligated in the 613 commandments, and that's why Al Dershowitz is Jewish, even if he doesn't believe that. But why does Al Dershowitz think he's Jewish? And here's part of Dershowitz's answer. Listen to this, okay? Yep. I know I will disappoint you when I say there is no single essence of Judaism, that Judaism changes and varies from generation to generation and location to location. I hate to admit that I think one of the greatest unifiers of Jews throughout the world, tragically, has been anti-Semitism, has been negative attitudes toward Jews. As Aaron Burke once said, I will remain a Jew so long as there are anti-Semites. That is a negative aspect of Judaism, to be sure, but we live in a very negative century. After all, we live in the century of the Holocaust. We live in the century where the Germans trying to kill a whole race of people who had very little in common with each other, many of whom did not even define themselves as Jews. It is too early from the Holocaust, but it's only 40 years since its end for us to try to think of more positive definitions of Judaism. We live in an age where three million Jews are held captive in the Soviet Union because they are Jewish. We live in a day where, according to just yesterday's New York Times, there is still considerable anti-Semitism in this country. Let's work on that problem first. Let's first try to eliminate the negatives. Let's first give us the freedom to be positive Jews the way we can. Let's try to build bridges and live in peace. Let's try to build bridges between the black communities and the Jewish communities, the Arab communities and the Jewish communities. Then we will have the luxury to sit back and think through positively what it is that brings us together. And in the end, we may find that there is very little that brings us together. In the end, we may find that Rabbi Kahana and I have less in common than I have with some of my Cambridge colleagues, or Rabbi Kahana has with some of his other colleagues who are not Jewish. I am not searching for the silver thread that brings us together. Okay, did you hear that? So yeah. Al Dershowitz, it's fascinating. Al Dershowitz is saying that we can't even think about what it means to be a Jew. Forty years ago, Hitler tried to kill all of us. And and there's Jews in the Soviet Union then behind the Iron Curtain. That was back in those days. And and we don't have the luxury. Don't ask me. We don't have the luxury to think about who we are, what it means to be a Jew. First, let's get rid of the anti-Semitism. Then after we get rid of it, we may find that there is nothing that makes us Jewish. And we have more in common with our non-Jewish neighbors than we do with our fellow Jews. That's another version. This is Al Dershowitz. This is not a persecuted guy. This is not a you know downtrodden guy. This is Al Dershowitz. Okay, this is uh, he's saying that he has no idea what makes him Jewish. All he knows is that they're anti semitic Forty you heard that forty years ago. It's a it's a the century we live in. Such a century. Forty only forty years ago, Hitler tried to kill us. Now it's like eighty. But um, 40 years ago, more than that, Hitler tried to kill us. And we don't have the luxury to figure out what's a Jew. And we may find out after the anti after people stop bothering us and stop stopping, uh, stop wanting to kill us. There's no such thing. Your question about, see, that's a Zionist. And the reason why a normal Jew would not think that way, meaning a religious Jew. And when I say normal Jew, means he has a normal definition of Jew. The traditional definition of Jew, the way the Jews defined themselves for all these centuries, is because I know what it is to be a Jew. I'm commanded in 613 commandments. God gave Moses the Torah on Mount Sinai. He doesn't want to be Jewish. Let him not be Jewish, but he has a problem. He can't not be Jewish because he's persecuted as a Jew. And his fellow Jews are persecuted as Jews. And 40 years ago, Hitler tried to kill the Jews. See, you asked the question about having the Holocaust take up too much of their their psyches. It's their identity. Anti-Semitism is their identity. Without that, Israel's a Jewish state. What's a Jewish state? What's a Jew? Look what a Jew is. Listen to Al Dershowitz. That's, Theodore Herzl said the same thing. A Jew is somebody who the anti-Semite hates. Now, Israel tries to give Jews another alternative you're a nationality. But the Jews don't have any characteristics of a nationality. They didn't have a common land, language or culture. Nothing. So they made a language, modern Hebrew. They invented it in order. What they did was they synthesized an identity. 
their whole identity as Jews, this national Jewish identity, was created from scratch. They said that they created a language, modern Hebrew, a guy named Be- Eliezer ben Yehuda. He sat down and said, in order to be a nation, we have to have a language. That was one of the theories of nationalism, that you have a common language. Um, Sure, Germans speak German. Exactly. Poles exactly. speak Polish, so exactly. Jews now that, need to speak Jewish. Oh, but you see, see, that's the thing. Uh, there was, who's it? Eliezer Schwede, a professor Eliezer Schwede. He had a good uh, observation. He said, every language in the world is named after the people. Russia, Russian, English, England, English, um, France, French, China, Chinese. But Hebrew, to us, was always called Loshan HaKadosh, the holy tongue. And the reason is because language to the Jews, the Hebrew language to the Jews... Ironically, does not roll off the tongue. Well, uh, it depends. It depends what your natural, uh, how your tongue was trained. <laughs> but, but I think... It's yeah, got a few I, more, I, more syllables than I would like. Well, and I say the same thing to the French. Oh, I have to uh, get this like lockjaw, you know. Oh, I, it's just about how you were brought up. Um. The language, the Jewish language, the Hebrew, we'll call it, the holy tongue, the holy language, did not serve the same, did not have the same relationship with the Jews as Russia had to the Russians. Russia was a national language to the, of the Russians, meaning that was part of what made them a people. Like you said, Germans have to speak German. It wasn't that Jews, that this language unified us into a people. The only thing that unified us into a people was the Torah, the law. In Arabic, that rabbi... It's used... like they, they took the idea of a state or a nation and they wanted to work backwards, right? So like... You know, that is you, exactly... You have all these countries did. like Germany or Poland where... That is exactly... existed and, and these uh, attributes formed out of the existence of that state. And they're, you know... But when you're trying to create a Jewish state, you're like, well, we don't have one. They so were... we have to, we have to uh, create these attributes. Yes, they want to create a Jewish nationality, and and they um, they created a, a Jewish flag. Jews never had a flag. The Israeli flag existed before Israel. Hebrew existed before um, Israel. Uh, they created a Jewish a culture. They there's no Jewish culture. There's no such thing. There today, Israeli culture, the hummus suddenly became a Jewish food, a Jewish dance, Jewish song. The Arab, the, the Jewish music of the Syrian Jews sounded Arabic. Uh, the Sephardic Jews, the Jewish music of the American Jews sounded American. The, uh, there's no such thing as Jewish food. What happened was the Zionists not only worked backwards; they had a whole educational system. Ben Gurion assigned a guy, Ben Siendino, his name was, to create a revised Jewish history where the Jews, for all the thousands of years, were looking for self-determination and were looking, had their eyes on their lands. We never did. We had our eyes on a messianic renewal of the world. And the, the Holy Land was a holy land, like one giant synagogue. That's all it was. Nobody, we had no interest in sovereignty over it. If something's holy, it doesn't mean you need to own it. On the contrary, I'm sure you know that according to Judaism, you're not allowed to have a state of Israel before the Messiah. But put set that aside for now. The whole idea of what the, just like the language, they changed it from a holy language, uh, the language in which the Torah was given, a language that had no profanities. This is why it's called holy. A language that God spoke to the prophets in. They made it like the Chinese, like Chinese is to the China, like to the Chinese people. They made it like Russian is to the Russian people. They made it the national language. They stripped it of all its spirituality, left its husk, and then replaced everything inside its its innards. They replaced it with nationalist products. Something so, that that surprised me when I when I first watched one of your uh, videos uh, names. Yes. They wanted to create a, and, and they chose for whatever reason, they, sh- they didn't have to. They could have, ch- you want to hear the irony? When they were deciding where to go, what country to take, um, Palestine wasn't the only thing on the table. There was a Uganda plan, other plans. The religious Jews uh, who were, were cooperating with the Zionists, they said, why do we need Palestine? We're, we're all just looking for a safe place to go. Let's take the Uganda plan. 
Herzl said temporarily, maybe, yeah, but no, in order to get the buy-in of the Jews, see, he wanted to change the Jewish outlook. He wanted to change the Jewish personality. He wanted to change what the Jews were into another nationality so that after they are nationals, they'll normalize themselves. They won't deserve to be hated like the Zionists believed that the Jews deserved to be hated. And that was the cause of anti-Semitism. Jews never aspired to win gold medals. We never aspired to win Eurovision Song Contests or Nobel Prizes. The Jews had a mission. Our mission is to fulfill the 613 commandments, to spend our lives in God's service. As every Jew says every day in their prayers, this, and it's not only the prayers, but okay, the, the mitzvahs, the commandments are our life. They are the length of our days. And in them, we will toil day and night. We were, as the Bible describes the Jews' mission, a whole, a, a, King, a uh, kingdom of priests and a holy people. Think, I don't know, Shaolin monks on top of a hill, except instead of a hill, it's a ghetto, and instead of karate, it's uh, studying the Talmud and serving God. And you know, that an, an image comes to mind is the uh, there's like the Indiana Jones where he's got the 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 crystal or the the prize he's trying to take off of the, the little. Platform. I'm sorry. Uh, there, I, I, they, it's, it, it's a meme, but the idea is he doesn't want to trigger the trap that's going to crash around him. So he's got the crystal, and then he swaps it in with a rock, so that the that the temple doesn't collapse on him. It and, sounds and so that he can run away with the prize. And it, and I could see that you know Zionism is taking the the Jewish identity as a, a religious identity and swapping it out for the idolatry of statehood. I call it identity theft, and I wouldn't even I, I wouldn't even give it the honor of comparing it to a rock with what they replaced it with. And the Holy Land was a holy land is a place where if a Jew went there who's closer to God, like there's certain days that are holier, certain places that are holier, and the Holy Land, Palestine's a holy land. Um, but they made it into a national homeland. Homeland in English doesn't really say a lot about what a homeland is. The word doesn't tell you much. But in other languages, including Hebrew, it does. So you have fatherland, la patria in French, or mother Russia. Moledes in Hebrew, place you were born. Homeland, according to Zionism, Israel is the Jewish homeland because, as it says in Israel's Declaration of Independence, here the nation was born. According to Zionism, the, we were not born on Mount Sinai. We were born when we became a nationality, when the Jews, when Joshua went into the went into Holy Land and they, they had a, a, a state. That's when the people were born. This is all anti-Jewish. This is all really anti-Semitic. This is a, and they hate, not they hate Jews as Jews. They hate, let, let me qualify that because it doesn't fit into that definition of they hate Jews as Jews. They hate Judaism as Judaism. And it is oh, like one of those examples where somebody just makes an excuse to hate Judaism because of some uh, unreasonable... Uh, or maybe claim. that they hate Jews as Judaism? They, hate, they hated Jews as Jews, and they wanted to change the Jews. They tried to become non-Jews. It wouldn't work. So the only solution is to change the identity of the Jews. So they created this thing, the Jewish state. But here's the thing that makes Israel different than all other countries in the world. Jewish nationalism different than all the other nationalisms in the world, like white nationalism or other religious nationalisms like Christian nationalism. And I recently learned that Germany in the olden days also had such a type nationalism, or well, at least they were a nationality. Let me ask you something. Israel says that it's not just a Jewish state. It says it's the Jewish state. Right. There's a difference. Not just it happens to be one and not two. 
Not that it's the only. This is a quote from Benjamin Netanyahu. He says in his book, one of his books, I think it's called uh, In the Family of Nations or something to that effect. Page 88. I remember it because I quoted it, so I think it's page 88. Anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. Why? Because to say, I don't hate Jews, I have nothing against Jews, I'm just against Israel, I just don't want Israel to exist, is the same as saying, I have nothing against the French nationality or the French people, I just don't want France to exist. Meaning, as Avigdor Lieberman said, Danny I alone, other Zionists, it's on Israel's own website, what the definition of a Jewish state is, nationality. What France is to the French and Japan is to the Japanese, Israel is to the Jews. It's not, the definition of a Jewish state is not a state that has a majority of Jewish people, although it needs one in order to remain a Jewish state. It's not even a, a state that has a guaranteed majority of a Jewish people, although it needs to be in order to fulfill its mission. It's more. Israel claims something that no other country today claims. It claims that it is the national, it is the nation state of all the Jews all over the world. It claims it is the nation state, not of its citizens. There's such a thing as Israeli citizenship, but there's no such thing in Israeli law as Israeli nationality. The nationality is Jewish, and Israel is the state of the Jewish people. That means me, an American Jew, who never lived in Israel, don't plan on living in Israel, have nothing to do with Israel, don't want anything to do with Israel. Israel claims to be my nation state. The United States is not my nation state. Yeah, I'm a citizen of America, but I'm a Jewish by nationality, and Israel is the country of all Jews, of all people of Jewish nationality. Benjamin Netanyahu comes to America, speaks to Congress uh, about Barack Obama's Iran deal, and he says, I represent not only those who elected me, but all the Jews all over the world. Now, what kind of crazy thing is this, that a foreign head of state comes and says he represents American citizens? The answer is that we're citizens of America, but we're nation our nationality is Jewish. And Netanyahu claims to be my prime minister. He claims to be leader of the Jews. He's mentioned that uh, he called himself a leader of the Jews. Uh, what's Naftali Bennett said about Netanyahu after Obama insulted him? called him a coward, but he used a nasty colloquialism. Um, he said, insulting Netanyahu is not just insulting the Prime Minister of Israel, because Netanyahu is not just the Prime Minister of Israel. He's Prime Minister of all the Jews. Isn't that a messianic claim? No, they don't believe in any messianic anything. It's what messianic claim? No, nothing to do with messianic anything. I mean, nothing isn't he basically claiming to be the king of the Jews by saying that? King of the Jews. German nationalism was like this. I actually just recently learned that. I, I know that no country today uh, makes this claim. And I was wondering, I was searching for an answer if there was any ever nationality that made this claim. So I just saw, you know, where? In Norman Finkelstein's uh, PhD dissertation it was about Zionism. And mm. a footnote over there, he wrote that the Israeli type of Jewish nationalism mimics the German type of nationalism. And one of the things that he wrote is that Germans claimed to be one nationality in the country or whatever. The nation is the nation of the, all the German nationals. But, you know, I, I, I don't know more about what I just said than what I just told you. Mm -hmm. Going back to Israeli, nas Israeli uh, nationalism, there's no such thing as an Israeli nationality. You talk about Israel having a right to exist. I got to tell you something. Israel doesn't really exist as a nationality. Israel is only a business name. It's really the state of the Jews. It's the Jewish state. It claims to be my state. Yeah, king of the Jews, kind of. Prime minister of the Jews, yes. It's not a mess messianic claim. He's not, but Netanyahu is not religious at all. Netanyahu doesn't keep any of the commandments. He's totally secular, totally non-religious. Nothing he says has to do with Judaism. I, I didn't Judaism. say it was a valid claim. Yeah, no, but it's it's not even it, it's it's more it, like it's Germanic claim, nationalism, claim, right? But I, I'm saying you know there's a redefinition of the Jew. Yes, into this, 
So, yes. so it's sort of the king of the redefined yes. Jew. Now, it started with Theodore Herzl, the original uh, head of political Zionism. He, the origin, the originator of political Zionism, he, he decided that the Zionists have an officially legal right to speak in the name of the Jews. He, in his book, uh, The Jewish State, uh, conjure, he, he brought up some old... Roman law called negotiorum gestio, I think that's how you pronounce it. Basically, it means that if there's nobody here to take care of an object, let's say sitting on a boat, I'm allowed to uh, play that role as manager of that object, and now I have authority over it. And by the same token, the Jews have nobody to take care of them or to speak for them, and the Zionists are now filling that role. The Zionists always claims not merely like Christian nationalism, that Christianity is going to also be a nationalism, but rather that Zionism speaks for the Jews. We, they, the people in Israel, they are the Jews. They represent the Jews. They speak for the Jews. They are the state of the Jews. Like a ward of the state, like an orphan. Yes, yes, kind of, yes, kind of like the Vatican speaks for all Catholics, even though they don't demand loyalty as a political state from the Catholics, Israel, what's his face? Uh, what's the name of that spy? Jonathan Pollard. Jonathan Pollard, he had said not, um, not more than a couple of years ago that Jews in America should spy on America for Israel. He would advise them to do so because Jews have dual loyalty. That is anti-Semitic. What's anti-Semitic about Zionism is because I'm born Jewish. I automatically have loyalty to Israel. And what's anti-Semitic about that is because I'm born Jewish, I don't have the same choices that other people here have. If my neighbor who's a Christian or my neighbor who's a Muslim or my neighbor who's an atheist or a Buddhist doesn't like United States of America, they could move to Mexico or Canada and Mexico or Canada is their nation state. I, because I'm born Jewish, I have no choice in the matter what my nation state is. I could live in Mexico or Canada or France or England or China. Israel still claims by law. In 2018, they made something called the nation state law, which says that Israel is the nation state of all the Jews and only the Jews. Israel claims to be my nation state, and I have no choice in the matter because I'm born Jewish. Now, who's Jewish? How do they define Jewish, right? Now you have a chicken or, or the egg problem because if Israel is the state of the Jews, that means that you have a, a, a body of a population of Jewish people and Israel is their state. But who are the Jews? What makes somebody Jewish? Again, you're not allowed to use the regular Jewish story about the Torah on Mount Sinai. Ben-Gurion said the Knesset, their parliament, has a right to decide who's a Jew and what's a Jew today. So, for example, they have a law of return, right? Law of return says any Jew can automatically come to Israel and become a citizen. uh, No naturalization process necessary. Um, You don't have to be religious Jew. You could be an atheist, right? Obviously, it has nothing to do with religion. It has to do with nationality or race or ethnicity, however they're going to define Jew. So there was a guy named Brother Daniel. I called him Brother because he was a Carmelite monk. He was born Jewish, converted to Christianity. He was no anti-Semite. During World War II, he helped a lot of Jews escape from the Nazis. After Israel was created, he wanted to move to Israel and become a citizen based on the law of return. Israel's Supreme Court ruled because he practices Christianity, he's not Jewish. Now, mind you, by Jewish law, he's just as Jewish as Herzl and just as Jewish as Netanyahu. Even more Jewish than the atheist, close, actually closer to Judaism, closer to God, because Brother Daniel believed in a creator of the world. These Jewish atheists didn't. So he's closer to God than... Um, than atheist, whatever Judaism, uh, Judaism doesn't believe in Christianity, but we certainly believe it's a higher level than atheism. And if he would be an atheist, if Brother Daniel would say, I don't believe in any, any Messiah, any God, nothing, then he can come there, no problem, atheists can come. But if you believe in another religion, this is Israeli law, uh, if you believe in um, Islam or Hindu or Christianity, you're not Jewish. Now, go explain that. It's not explainable. Because without this definition of Jew, there is no other criteria by which to declare a person Jewish. What about an atheist Jew? 
in the diaspora. They, they are entitled to the law of return. So an atheist has more claim than someone with faith. Yes. If that, and unless... Potentially. Yes, potentially. Absolutely. Absolutely. It has... Yeah, the reason is because they had a picture in their mind of what they wanted to change the Jews into. This is the real reason. The Jews used to be like me and a bunch of Jews together studying, poring over some old books and stuff like that. This was our life. This is our life and the length of our days. That was disgusting to them. It was no no wonder people hate us. People hate the Jews, of course. Just look at them. Even though they persecuted the non-religious Jews, but that's because the picture of a Jew in people's mind is still a religious person. Whenever Shakespeare portrayed a Jew, it was a religious Jew, right? Um, so we have right. to... I'm thinking about uh, the the quote from Jabotinsky about the, the the pardon pardon the expression the yid quote. Oh yes, the goal of Zionism is to create a person with a separate, a different personality than a yid. Yid is a derogatory Russian um, word for Jew, kind of like kike. Um, or the N word by for black people, and he says because a Jew is ugly, because a jid is ugly, the Hebrew that's what they call themselves in those days is going to be handsome, because a jid is weak, the Hebrew is going to be strong, etc., etc., etc. So they had a picture. They wanted people like Netanyahu, like Ariel Sharon, like like these warriors and. When Jabotinsky said he wants people the diametric opposite of a Jew, you need to understand that in order to understand of what's a stereotype of a Jew. But of a stereotype of a Jew, but even our values, we hate wars. We don't have war heroes. Masada, does, does that again is 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 that that's again same the same thing. It, the identity depends on the anti semite. Because he well, is defining the Jew as the opposite of the anti-Semitic definition of a Jew. Well, but he wasn't. He was the def- well. He agreed with the thing is that yes, but but he also independently believed that anti-Semitic stereotype. So it's not that he was relying on other anti-Semites. He, the Zionists accepted those anti-Semitic stereotypes as well. So they wanted to fix the Jews. So. There's there's scholarship that says, that suggests, and I agree with them, that the Zionist personality, the culture that was created in Israel was an overcorrection for the old Jewish pacifism and studiousness and etc. The image of the Sabra walking around like a kind of like uh, this big guy in sandals without a care in the world in the desert uh, drinking his Israeli juice or whatever Israelis drink and it was just the opposite of a guy who's sitting in the study hall skinny guy in but there's also a, kind of like a, a you know a, a masculine um, yes unmanly and unmasculine were words that the Zionists, particularly Jabotinsky, used often to describe Jews. So here you have two things combined. You have, first of all, a fake identity. It's all smoke and mirrors. You have a personality that was designed to be specifically the opposite personality values of a religious, uh, I won't say hermetic life, but a monastic life. Just the opposite, Okay. And they want to be warriors. That was so important to them, to be warriors and strong. We're not weak anymore. We're no more holocausts. A pers- it wasn't just a slogan. It was part of their identity, part of their personality. Add that to the fact that the definition of a Jew, the best definition of a Jew, somebody the anti-Semites hate. So you have so much of this, we're going to kill the anti-Semites before they kill us baked into not their into their identity it is their identity and there there was a quote about the the shaking knees i think oh so let me tell you that's a very good example menachem begin i'm not a jew with with the trembling knees 
Now, do you know where that comes from? Uh, everybody quotes, I, I, I remember recently in Brooklyn College, I uh, mentioned this. Uh, I'm not a Jew with trembling knees. And everybody quotes it from Menachem Begin as if he invented it. He didn't. There was a Zionist poet, Chaim Nachman Bialik, his name was. And he wrote a, he wrote a poem. You could look it up. Uh, City of Slaughter, it's called. It's a story about the Jews uh, in a pogrom. And the pogromniks come and they kill and they slaughter and rape and, and, and murder the Jews. And the men hide, crawl under beds or hide behind doors. And they're watching everything happen. And he describes what's going on in their head. Oh, Lord, please save me from this. And meantime, he describes in lurid detail what's going on over there in the pogrom. And when it's all over, the Jew goes to the rabbi and says, Rabbi, my wife was raped. Am I still allowed to remain married to her? And all is back to the same thing that it was. And the story starts again, eventually, sooner or later. And that's the Jewish life. And the poem has in it the anger at God that, that uh, let fists fly at the heavenly throne. and It's disgusting. And he says over there, part of, in the poem, he uses the phrase, with trembling knees, they stood there. That's where Menachem Begin got it from. And it means not just trembling knees. We're not religious Jews. Those religious Jews, they're disgusting. Look, he, they caricaturized us. That's anti-Semitic. Literally, the stuff that you'd find from in Nazi Germany, the Zionists churned out at the beginning of the 20th century, so much. And this this is where Menachem Begin gets it from. And the people that have this baked into their personalities, now they don't even realize what they're saying or what it means. They don't even realize what they've been conditioned to become. Now, um, can I just for a second sure. maybe steel man that? You know, I think, you know, that poem portrays, you know, a very dark scene. And... You know, I could see why the the character in it is, you know, angry with God, let's say. Um, because oh, the writer is angry with God. The character it, loves God. Sure, right. sure. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, He's like a narrator. So, so um, I can see it as a, maybe a coping mechanism or an attempt to find redemption to say, next time I'm not going to let them kill me. And, and that seems to be in the psyche of, of the Zionist today. So, I mean, I could see there being, you know, I'm just trying to say that there could be a reasonable uh, interpretation of that that says, I don't I don't want this to happen again, right? It, it could be, it could have been reasonable had he not caricatured the Jews. If he would make a poem, there was a terrible pogrom and I don't want it to happen again and we won't let it happen again, that's fine. But the whole idea was, we're not going to be like those disgusting people. We need to change. Not, I'm not, we're not going to let it happen again. It's going to be a new we, a new us. We're not going to be like them. We're going to transform the Jewish people into normal people, not like disgusting, weakling, coward, uh, lunatics like these religious Jews. That's what the poem was about. The, the phrase self-hating Jew comes to mind. Absolutely. Absolutely. No question about it. And... In Herzl's theory, Herzl's, uh, Herzl wrote an essay called Mauschel. Mauschel, also a derogatory name for a Jew. Um, basically, he says that uh, the anti-Zionist Jews, or the Jews that don't want to cooperate with Zionism back in those days, they're not Jews. They're from a different race. They don't, Jews, he says, like to collect art, appreciate art. Mauschels, they sell art. Okay. At the end of, and he goes through a whole thing like that. Literally, anti-Semitic tropes from the Zionists. Now, it's like a, it's like a like a year zero scenario almost. Year zero. Year zero when um, when they, when they basically in in China they wanted to wipe oh. out everything and do a full cultural reset. Yeah, that's it's just yeah, wipe, I, wipe out all the history of exactly what we were and that's start exact, fresh. Exactly what it was, and this is why, by the way, you know the Orthodox Jews refused to serve in the Israeli army, even if there were no issues with what you know the army does. 
The army was designed by Ben-Gurion to be not merely a military. He called it a melting pot. They actually take Jews from all sorts of cultures and make them into Hebrew warriors. They teach them about Judaism. In the officer's training manual, there's topics like, what is Judaism? Is it a civilization? Is it a religion? Is it a culture, etc.? It's a religious indoctrination camp to the godless religion of Zionism. And just as if we would uh, not serve in, never mind, it's true, Jews are not allowed to wage war nowadays, we're not allowed, that's true. Jews are not allowed to have their own country, that's also true. But aside from all these religious reasons not to go to the army, morally, Israeli army is different than all other armies. It's a religious indoctrination camp for a particular religion of Zionism and happens to also be a military. And they designed it specifically to be that. And they designed the draft specifically to take all the different types of people from wherever they're coming. I described all sorts of different types of Jews before. You go to the Israeli army, you all come out with the same attitude. Yeah, you could be religious in the sense you can still eat kosher. Sometimes, sometimes they come out not eating kosher. They throw away their religion altogether. But even if you don't, this Zionist warrior attitude, this, I'm a Hebrew now, you know, this Israeli mindset, that's where you get it. That and the public schools and the the Orthodox Jews don't go to the public schools. Their only hope is the army. The Russians did that. The Cantonists, they they used the army as a religious indoctrination camp. And this is what the Zionists are doing too. It has nothing to do with serving country, nothing like that. It has. If Israel would have a normal army, yeah, then we'd have to have religious reasons not to go. We have to rely on, the, it's true, for our religion will not allow us to go to, to make a war nowadays. But currently... From a moral perspective, Israel has no right to demand anybody serve in their army. When you make your army normal army like all the other armies in the world, we can talk. But now, your army is a religious indoctrination camp. We're not obligated to bow to your Zionist gods. That's first of all. Second, this idea that Israel claims to be the state of all Jews, there is no other country like that in the world. And the flip side of Israel claiming to be my country is that Israel is not the country of its non-Jewish citizens. Let's take the Druze, for example. The Druze, it's a religion. Small percentage, they're like Arabs, but they're religion Druze, and they're Zionists. In general, they fight in Israel's army, and they're loyal Zionists, and they speak Hebrew. You could be a Druze, and you could fight in Israel's army for generations, hundreds of years down the line, be the most loyal Zionist, most loyal Israeli, speak Hebrew with a perfect accent, sing the Israeli national anthem by heart. But because you're not Jewish, Israel's not your country. You have no self-determination rights. You still must remain a minority. You and those other religions put together, you must remain a minority because Israel has to be the state of the Jews, not just a Jewish state, the state of the Jews. You are not, if, if you st- go to Germany and you stay there for a thousand years, you're part of the German nationality, right? We're in America. I, I know America is different in that sense, but everybody came from somewhere. We're less than 250 years old. We're all Americans. You could, no matter how, mo- how loyal you are to Israel and how long, how many generations of centuries you're there, you have no self-determination rights there unless you're of the Jewish nationality. Now, how do you become of the Jewish secular, non-religious nationality? You convert to Judaism. Does that make any sense? No. Sounds pretty convoluted to me. It's very convoluted. And the reason it's convoluted is because, like I always say, I wrote this in my book, that let's say a guy doesn't believe, a guy is not going to recognize, doesn't recognize the existence of the number four. He counts one, two, three, five, six, seven. No problem. It's a free country. He could believe whatever he wants. No problem. Ask him what 10 minus 6 equals and tell him to, to, to work it out on paper. <laughs> so if you want to say, you want to take this population of Jews, which are very, very precisely defined by the Jewish religion and have been in the same way, using the same mechanisms for thousands of years, and say, no, that's not the definition. 
We have another definition. It's not going to fit. You're going to have, they didn't envision, they don't want, I said they had a picture of what a Jew is. So the reason why they don't want Christians, is Christian Jews, is because th their vision of what a Jew is, of what a Jewish state is going to be, of the normal Jewish people, is not a bunch of Jews with crosses around their necks and robes and bishop hats. They don't want that. They have a certain vision, and they try to to squeeze this population of people called Jews into their definition, and it doesn't work. It's very convoluted. So, number one, if anybody tells you that there is only one Jewish state and 25 or however many Muslim states or Arab states, tell them it's not true. There is not a single Muslim or Arab state in this planet that is a Muslim state in the sense that Israel claims to be a Jewish one. There is no Muslim state that claims to be the nation state of all Muslims, and there's no Arab state on this planet that claims to be an Arab state in the sense that Israel claims to be the Jewish one. Israel is the only country like that. And if you go and get back to Jonathan Sachs, when he says, okay, you can criticize a policy, but you can't say countries shouldn't exist, watch this. I'm going to criticize a policy. I want Israel to change one policy. You're not the state of the Jews. You're the state of the Israelis. That's all I want. Israeli citizen, Israeli nationality. Separate the Jews from Israel. That's all I want. That's a policy, right? Well, guess what? So, so is that a now, so, sort of like church and state, right? Sort of like, yes, sort of like church and state. It's hard to figure if the Jewish identity is considered church in Israeli law. They don't separate church and state like England's doesn't, right? Uh, but all I'm saying is, you say you're the state of the Jews, you're not. You're the state of the Israelis, the citizens. Citizenship and nationality are the same, like it is in the United States of America. That's a policy. Guess what? If they would do that, Israel would not exist. Because Israel, the identity of Israel, just like they created an identity for the Jews, they created an identity for this country, the nation state of the Jews. Again, Israel's just a business name. If Israel changes from the nation state of the Jews to the nation state of the Israelis, which means regardless of what religion you are practice, you are you have national self determination rights here, then that is what other people would call quote unquote the one state solution. You're living in a democracy. But Israel describes this as People want Israel destroyed and shouldn't exist, rights to exist. No problem exist. On the contrary, I say Israel doesn't exist now. I say Israel now is just a shell. It's a doing business as name. I want Israel to become a nationality. Not only should Israeli be a citizenship, let Israeli become a nationality. And let Israel be the state of that nationality. One policy, that's all I ask. See how easy it is? What, if it, be, what if it became an actual theocracy? How could it become a theocracy? What religion is going to is going to run Israel? I'm I'm just trying to throw out hypotheticals. Give me a hypothetical a theocracy of what religion? Well, well, you know, like Christian Nash. Well, I don't know, like Christian nationalism wants to have a, a Christian uh, country. You know, first of all, a democracy. When... Be because you know, you've described how Zionism has redefined a Jew. Mm -hmm. So let's say Israel re reconstitutes itself to define the Jew properly. And then okay. it says, okay, we're the state of that. What, what do you mean? Jews, a religion, we have no state that doesn't go into the uh, framework of being Jewish. Like, imagine a bunch of so guys. So it's a in contradiction in terms, you're saying. Well, imagine a bunch of guys in the Middle East say, we're the state of all Christians, all people who believe in Jesus. What kind of crazy thing is that? Who made you? What? What does it even mean? I have a state. It's the United States of America. I have a country. What, what connection do I have with them? If the Jews are not a nationality, what connection does that random country in the Middle East have with me? They could say whatever they want. It would be a joke. It wouldn't even make any sense. In order to be the country of a certain population, that population has to be either your citizens or a nationality. You want to be like the Vatican? Is that what you're suggesting? Like you'll have a pope that's the head of the Jewish religion the way the Vatican is the head of the Christian religion? Well, we don't have a pope. There's no such position. There's pope no such Milikowski. position. What? 
Pope Milikowski. Right, exactly. There's no such position in Judaism. It's it's a you have another branch of Judaism. You want to make a new religion and make a theocracy of of atheists. Anyway, the Zionists are atheists. They won't want that. The majority of Israel is not religious. So this 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 whole thing. It, when when I first watched when you're you describing this, case. It, it struck me as grossly scandalous. It is. It is and, grossly and, and scandalous. A, a massive grift, and I, and I was shocked. Honestly, yep. I think like this has got to be some kind of weird fringe conspiracy no. theory. <laughs> like so this to me sounded like, you know, on, on the level of the protocols of the elders of Zion. You know what I mean? And, and if you know what sustains it? You heard Al Dershowitz. We don't have time now to think about these things. There are Jews in the Soviet Union behind the Iron Curtain. And 40 years ago, there was a Holocaust. So long as they're busy, the whole world wants to kill us. There's a Holocaust and Holocaust mentality and anti-Semites. You heard Al Dershowitz. The urgency they, of They don't of, have time. They don't have the luxury right. to think about these things. So whatever they're being fed by the elites, by the Zionists, they eat up. And, and they they transform into the whole thing is a scam. And the world is not interested in attacking. I, I say I have no doubt that the way to solve the problem in the Middle East, the way to make peace over there is to just get rid of this crazy ideology called Zionism. Just get rid of Zionism. And and Israel will then if you extract Zionism from Israel remove Zionism from Israel, remove the idea that you're the state of the Jewish nationality, you become the state of the Israelis, which means you either annex the territories or you let them go. You annex them the way America, when they were like Texas. A Marshall, like a Mexico. Marshall Plan or something? Exactly. Oh, you do something. But you. the reason why this is a problem, the reason why all this is happening, because if Israel's the state of the Jews, it cannot have a non-Jewish majority. Or can't even be close. So it has to maintain the Jewish majority. So it can't annex millions of non-Jewish. It doesn't matter if they're Muslims or Palestinians or Buddhists or Christians. You cannot have all this territory with millions of people that are not Jews. And they don't want to I'm let I'm going to throw out a, a rhetorical trope. So where are all the Jews supposed to go? They can stay there. I understand. America is 70%, approximately 70% Christian, list I looked. Israel's is approximately 70% Jewish, give or take some percentage points there. Is, uh, uh, this is a democracy, United States of America. The Christians don't have to run somewhere because they're a majority, just they're being a Christian majority because we have freedom of religion and we're not the state of the Christians, we're the state of the Americans. I don't care. I'm perfectly comfortable living as a Jew in the United States of America. And non-Jews will either be a majority or a minority. Could be demographics will change. It doesn't matter. Who says they have to go anywhere? Let Israel become like the United States of America. See, that's part of the problem. Israel keeps talking. It's, it's their propaganda. They keep saying, well, well, the only solution is to, they want to destroy Israel. Israel rights to exist. Right to exist sounds. The only deadly. democratic state in the Middle East. Oh, yeah. Uh, forget about that for now. But the idea of rights to exist sounds like you want them not to exist and 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 to destroy Israel and forget the, the even the word destroy. It's, it's nihilistic change. language. Level it? It, yes, a nihilistic language. All I want is change one policy. Change one policy. That's it. Israel. You, you, Sachs said that we're allowed to criticize the policies of Israel. Right? Fine. Israel exists, but. You're no longer the state of the Jews. You're the state of your citizens like every other country. That's all. Guess what? It's problem solved. Now, there's two issues. Issue number one, the Zionists will tell you now Israel doesn't exist then. On the contrary, I tell them I want Israel to exist. Israel doesn't exist. It's just a name. The, the state of the Jews exists. Let Israel exist. The state of the Israeli nationality. Make an Israeli nationality. And every citizen is an Israeli national. Do that. Um, the only problem is the security problem. People are scared that if um, they allow equal rights to everybody, uh, the non-Jews will, there'll be massacres. So, okay, so work it out. You know, I remember, to I remember, I mean, I remember studying how Thomas Jefferson said the same thing about freeing the slaves. Um, you free the slaves, they'll kill all the whites. Um, work it out. 
so, or at least, you know what? Maybe it can't be worked out. If my plan can't be worked out, I don't have a solution. I'm not King Solomon. I know what to tell you. But what I am saying is that all this talk and energy and resources that go into this, this, this useless and pointless discussion of one state, two state, red state, blue state, which is leading nowhere, should be put into this one problem. How do you safely, safely, because I only suggest this if it will be a safe transformation, how do you safely transform Israel? into the state of all the Israeli citizens. Can it be done? Show me the studies. Give me the scholarship on that. Work that that is the million-dollar question, isn't it? Because it seems that for uh, all, the, all, the, all the critique we can have and the legitimacy of it, they've painted themselves into a corner where they haven't really made a lot of friends. You know what? You know what? And, and, you. And, and, and I could see there being legitimate uh, security concerns. Fine. Whether f- for you for, for the sake Fine. of what they've done wrong. Agree. Deal with it. Meaning when they freed the slaves here, they took black people out of their continent in chains on ships and made them slaves. Slaves. I mean, I'm not, I don't need to describe to you what a life of a slave was. Right? right. And there were slave rebellions. Right. And whatever the uh, Israelis have in terms of enemies, the white people had in terms of enemies for in the slaves, right? Okay. They freed them. It worked out. Other if, places. If it's wrong, it's wrong. That's true, but but it's also wrong to allow bloodbaths. In other words, that would also be wrong. Hmm. The question is people need work it out. Try to find solutions to that. The issue is they're trying to find solutions to a problem. That is not solvable. Where is the other state going to be? What are they going to do with the settlers? The fifth, a half a century, they've been talking about this. Fine. You thought it may work after a half a century of getting nowhere. Maybe try another approach. But they won't try this approach because by trying this approach, do you know what this means to Zionism? It means that every Zionist has to give up their identity, their selves, their, their self-image their history, they will look at themselves as being destroyed. That's what is, two things are holding this together, are maintaining this facade. And they're really two sides of the same thing. Thing number one is what you heard from Dershowitz. The whole world wants to kill us. We don't have time now to think of anything else, even what a Jew is. It sounds insane, and it is insane. But Holocaust studies, you mentioned it yourself, Holocaust museums and Holocaust studies and everything is the Holocaust and Holocaust. And of course, there are important lessons to learn from the Holocaust. The problem is the Holocaust studies always end with, okay, and now we have Israel. It's always a binary, either Holocaust or Israel. When these kids go to Auschwitz to visit Auschwitz, they're not going you know, to, to find out something about how low humanity can, can sink. They're, they're learning that too, but they're learning about their identity. They come out of Auschwitz with the Israeli flags draped uh, uh, across their back. The problem with the Holocaust studies is the last chapter. The last chapter is the state of Israel. Tear out that last chapter. But to the Zionists, you see, you have that book of Holocaust studies, right? And the last chapter is the state of Israel. If you tear out that last chapter, where does that book end? Auschwitz. Those are the only two worlds that they know. Auschwitz or Israel. One of the two. Golda Meir said that she would, what was the quote she has? She would rather die than go back to the dark past of the Jewish people. They'd rather die than go back to their fake dark past. Yes, Jews were persecuted. Of course they were. But no one's going back to the past. We're going to the future. Uh, as all the, you know, the stock brokers say, uh, Past performance doesn't guarantee future performance, right? right? We're not going back to the past. We're going to the future. There, there's smart people involved. Work it out. Try to work. If have it have work, a little hope. Yeah, if it doesn't work out, fine. We're back to where we are today. But this really is the solution because as long as Israel is that doesn't exist, as long as Israel, as long as only the Jewish state exists, this is not a solvable problem. A There's a solution, maybe, but you're not going to have, uh, you're not going to have anything else. It's not going to, it's not going to change their identity 
and this fear mongering. It's fear mongering this Holocaust stuff. It definitely has uh, got a dark existential tone in it. You know, when Netanyahu talks about Amalek, and you know, it's just it just gets darker and darker with each iteration. And, and what what he's doing is he knows he's not religious. He doesn't believe in the whole biblical story of Amalek. That's how we pronounce it. Um, he doesn't believe in the whole story. And and the idea, and you see, here's that that idea of Zionism replacing Judaism. Amalek in our theology, they're not really even human beings. Today, you can call them androids. I don't know what. Spiritually, they're like evil incarnate. They're not even human beings. Killing them isn't really even murder. It's Demons. Like, uh, I don't want to get into things that have other religious connotations. Okay, but gotcha. We'll yep. just call them evil incarnate. And there's a there, there is a genealogy to them. They have to be the great, great, direct paternally uh, descendants of Esau, Yaakov's brother, who had there was an actual nation on Molech, uh, him and his concubine Timna. They had they had a seed on Molech. And we can't identify who these people are, what they are. And today it's irrelevant. It was relevant. So was, was there not was there not a commandment to to wipe them out? And yes, was they, that was that not were, carried out? What? Yes, when they were a nation, when they were together. Yes, of course. But what does that have to do with the Palestinians? Are the Palestinians the grandchildren of Asaph? Is he telling him? Is he telling us that he figured out that the Palestinians are genealogically descendants of these non people, as you call them, demons? That's crazy. He's not claiming that. It's impossible anyway. Because the Muslims, the Arabs, uh, every the, even the Zionists say, I'm not saying, I, I don't know if it's, you know, how the generations change things, but they are the officially the descendants of Yishmoel, who can't be, they can't be Amalek, uh, really, according to the story. They can't be. But never mind that. What is he? He just made that up. Amalek, uh, let me ask you something. You know what this is like saying, They let's say Jeffrey Dahmer, Right. Jeffrey Dahmer deserves to die, okay? All the Palestinians are all Jeffrey Dahmer. What kind of crazy thing is that? What? And they'll send, and then you'll have people saying, well, wasn't Jeffrey Dahmer put to death? So wasn't there a legal command to put Jeffrey Dahmer to death? So if Jeffrey Dahmer was put to death, that means you can kill anybody you want, right? Because you can kill people. That's what, by the way, that's what anti Semites are doing over here. The story of Amalek in the Torah is specifically directed at a group of people that all deserved to die. They weren't even real people, just like somebody put to death in a guest chamber because of a crime they committed. You could agree or disagree with God. God decides who lives and who dies. Every year, millions of people die all over the world. Who kills them? God. Does anybody have any problem with people dying? No. Because you don't believe in God, you don't believe in God, you do believe in God, you understand that God has a cosmic plan and he plans out everything, right? He decides who lives and who dies. If he decided that right now this group of people called Amalek, and I put the word people in, pare- in quotation marks because they weren't really even people, now their time is up. I could make an earthquake. If God would make an earthquake and, and the ground would swallow up the Amalek like it did many other people, nobody would have a problem with it. Just God did it in this way. So now people who don't believe the story of the Bible, they believe that people made it up, and they believe that that gives human beings a license to say we can kill anybody, just like we said we kill Amalek, and we're using Amalek as a role model. But that doesn't make any sense, because if you do believe the story of the Bible, that means God himself decided now's the time for these people to die. Absent any such decision by God openly to a prophet, you can kill people. Just like you can't people kill people just because you killed Jeffrey Dahmer. What kind of thing is this? Netanyahu's crazy. It's it's insane. But what it what it is is he's making the people who are the enemies of Israel like inherently, existentially evil. Like they're enemies of God, enemies of reality. The Amalek is like it's the enemy of all things good. It's like the opposite of all things good, the incarnation of all things evil. 
It's not just random people that some guy, yeah, if you believe that some guy wrote the Bible, then you don't even believe the story because that's not the story in the Bible. The story is that God came himself and said, this is the command, these people time to die. I say they deserve to die. They're not even real human beings. You as a human may not recognize it, but God says so. God, I created them. I built them. They're my androids or whatever you want to say, call it. Absent God, the whole story doesn't make any sense. So now I know there are people on social media, oh, look how the Bible is genocidal. What kind of nonsense is that? God is genocidal every time he makes a tsunami and kills 100,000 people. Does anybody say God is genocidal? Well, the, the, the difference over here is that people don't believe it's God that wrote the Bible. And fine, you don't want to believe it. You don't have, I'm not telling you now to believe it. But you don't believe God. It, but but, but I just mean in, in terms of, <laughs> of, of, of Ju- the Jewish understanding or the, the you know, the, tel- the, the Tanakh. To anybody the, the, that... The, 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 the Palestinians are not Amalek. Why, why they're, would they're they not, They're why, not descended. Why, why would they be? Right. It doesn't make any sense rhetorically to dehumanize them for the for yeah, the yeah, for the political you know, implication think, of you, war. You know, it's really yeah. It's just it's just he's a that's an evil thing that Netanyahu did. Uh, Netanyahu is, and this is a man that doesn't believe in the Bible. This is a completely non-religious, completely secular man. He he doesn't eat kosher food. He, he's uh, nothing. Uh, it, it's unbelievable how this. You talk about a scam, a grift. Look what's going on over here. You have a guy who people think that Jewish state, Israel, has to do with Judaism. He's he's completely unreligious. When they created Israel, they wrote the Declaration of Independence. They don't have a constitution, but they have a Declaration of Independence. They refused to put the word God in there. In America, our currency in God we trust, there was a rabbi a famous rabbi that refused to bring American currency into the bathroom out of respect for God's name, because in the currency it has God's name. Israel refused to put God's name in their Declaration of Independence. Ben Gurion said, "No, we don't have to believe. We we're not bound. We 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 don't want to commit ourselves to God, even to His existence." He refused. America is not committed to God's existence. You're allowed to be an atheist, but you know they have the Ten Commandments in the. Supreme Court and one nation under God with liberty and justice for all. Israel refused. They, the religious people begged them, look, a country, Jew, Israel, they were very worried about the separation of the Jewish identity from God. Without God, there is no Jews. So they put in rock of Israel. We believe with, with and Ben-Gurion said everybody can interpret it the way he wants. You can say it's God, you could say it's the Israeli army, whatever you want. Rock of Israel is a biblical phrase. It's Sur Yisrael. Um, it's a scam. And then what they do is they go to Jews and they say, look, Jews, where will you be without Israel? When, they, when not if, when there's another Holocaust in America, because of all the Holocaust studies, right? Holocaust studies. But now there's going to be another Holocaust. And in Germany, nobody expected a Holocaust. And it was a democracy. America is not better than Germany. America, you think the Holocaust started with... I saw today online and people were saying, you think America, uh, the Holocaust started with concentration camps? No, it started with this passive-aggressive anti-Semitism kind of stuff that we have today. We're always... It's like Germany in the 1930s. Today in America, I want to tell you something. 50 years ago, I remember they were saying it's like Germany in the 1930s. By that reckoning, today uh, America is like Germany in the 1980s. But, and and they, they put the fear, not the fear of God, the fear of Hitler. Everybody's Hitler. Hitler, the Hitler du jour. It's Hitler's coming and, and the Jews were taken by surprise and they went like sheep to the slaughter and we got to be ready and never again. And look, listen to, to coming from a guy like Dershowitz, you know, civilized educated, at least secularly guy, to talk like that, he's talking like a lunatic. You know, you don't want to be a Jew, say, I don't want to be a Jew, I don't care about Jewishness, I don't care, you know, I'm a assimilated guy. But this is uh, I worry. I worry about the temptation of anti-Semitism um, emerging from frustration with what's going on with I Israel agree. and Palestine I agree. right now. Because you say anything against Israel, and you're immediately accused of being an anti-Semite. And at some point, people are going to be frustrated and they're going to say, I find your terms acceptable. 
you know and, what? And they'll just go along with it. They'll say, fine then. Yeah, right? I agree with you. I, I share your fear. And that's a, that's a real concern. It really is a real concern. But Israel just wins if that happens. Because then they tell everybody, you got to move to Israel, which they're saying already. Israeli people. When the... The when safest the place happened, in the world where you're always under existential threat. It is the most dangerous place in the world where Jews live. The most dangerous place. The odds of you getting killed in Israel because you're a Jew are greater than anywhere Jews live anywhere else in the world. And our President Biden, certainly he was forced to say this by Zionist lobbyists, that if it wasn't for Israel, Jews wouldn't be safe anywhere in the world. He said that recently. First of all, that itself is, that's disgusting. I'm an American. I pay taxes, you know. A lot of taxes because I live in New York and New York City. And he's telling, I rely on him to protect me like everybody else. That's what this country is about, right? We're a nation. We protect each other. Security is the, the probably maybe the most important thing that you expect from a government in return for your loyalty and taxes. And he's saying that everybody in the country, he can protect except the Jews, a foreign country protects you. Now, let me tell you why this is anti-Semitic. Because why, why should people be loyal to their countries? They're loyal to their countries because it's transactional. I'm loyal to my country because of what my country does for me. Transactional makes it sound so robotic. It's gratitude, right? It's a relationship. Uh, if California... It's a, it's is, a reciprocal, mutual loyalty. Reciprocal, mutual thing. But if Israel is what provides me my security, not the United States, then correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm not, then the loyalty that I would owe to my country for protecting me is now owed by every Jew to Israel. There's X amount of loyalty that you owe your country because your country is going to protect you. But if our president said, my country will not protect me. Israel will protect me. Who do I owe that loyalty to? That loyalty that is deserved by that country that will protect me. That's a dual loyalty trope. And that's what Israel wants. Remember, Jews are not really Americans. Jews are a nationality and Israel's the state of that nationality. If you want a definition of Zionism... The Zionists will, will... You pretty much, pretty much make the Jew into a foreigner in his own country. That's exactly, exactly what it is. And that's an anti-Semitic trope. Hitler, in Mein Kampf, wrote that the Jews, we got to get rid of them. Um, they're not real Germans. He says they may look like, and they say that they're Germans practicing a different religion, but they're lying. He says they're really not Germans. They're another people. And then he says, if you don't believe me, any doubt that I had, go ask a Zionist. He says, any doubt that I had about this was, uh, was absolved by a large group of these Jews called Zionists who say that the Jews are a nationality and the other Jews. Did he specifically not... cited Zionism? Yes. Yes, he did. He specifically. Go to any Kindle edition or online edition of Mein Kampf and search for the word Zionist. That's where it will come up. If I remember right, it's chapter two, uh, my life in Vienna, something like that. He specifically I'd, cited Zionism, specifically. I'd like to uh, broaden the scope a little bit more geop geopolitically. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think you've made a, a pretty strong case that Zionism and the state of Israel is not indeed the state of the Jews. Um in, in terms of the original definition of what a Jew is, is a religious um, people. This um, grift or co-optation um, brings with it a number of lies, and those who believe it and support Israel in good faith, maybe, you know, they, they haven't had a chance to talk to you. And uh, you know, the majority of support for Israel, for example, right now comes from Christian Zionists in the West. In fact, without that support, the state of Israel would be in big trouble. Or or perhaps maybe not even in big trouble, but forced to negotiate with its neighbors in a different way than uh, dropping American bombs on them. 
how I, I think of all these, you know, Western Christian Zionists who who believe that they're they're doing the right thing by God in their own faith by supporting Israel no matter what. How um, how obscene is that? That 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 their religious faith is being, you know, abused. I, I think about how Israel has become this epicenter of theological and geopolitical conflict and strife. You know, we we could be on the verge of something looking like a World War Three, all for the sake of this holy land that's being contested and, let's say, hijacked by an ideology that isn't even true to, to Judaism. Uh, Islam has, you know, some stake in it. Their, their, their eschatology is different as coming to the, the theme that we were, uh, I was hoping to get to. Maybe we can touch on a little bit. Uh, we have, you know, the end times of Christianity expects there to be something happens in Israel, right? The Armageddon is the, the Battle of Megiddo happens there, right? Everything centers on Israel. And if we have all of this eschatological end of the world anxiety about getting this right, and what's happening today is premised on a lie, what does that mean? I, 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 I guess I'm just trying to keep that as an open question. I don't have a specific direction I'm taking you there, but maybe just if you look at it in that framework, what do you think about that? As, as a consequence for the world? Well, I'm a Jew, and because the Jews have only one version of the end of days, it's not always 100% clear. It's not terribly important for us to know what's going to be. We'll find out. It's more important for me to know if that kid is born, is he really Jewish, which is relevant now. Um, so I'm not worried about the eschatologies of the other religions and once the Messiah comes we're talking about God is kind of running the world so we're in good hands then what I'm worried about more is what's going on now you know the idea that there are these people there's this ideology that according to Judaism, is like the opposite of Judaism that's running something that calls itself the state of the Jewish people that's perceived that way by the whole world. The evangelical Christians actually were Zionists hundreds of years, a couple hundred years before any Jewish Zionist was, late 1500s, early 1600s. And then the, their movement increased only amongst the Protestants, not the Catholics. And it's all for a scam. And what I wish I could do is, is I wish I could like show people like what this whole, this whole scam is about. And I try my best. And there are people that, that are working on doing it. But I'm like banging my head against the wall looking at this. And it's such a a word to use. It's such a pity. It's it's pathetic. It, and it, it doesn't have to be. It's like I could see this whole thing by the, like, you know, bad forces are running the whole show over here because this is too crazy and people are dying and people are getting killed. And as you said, we could be on the brink of World War Three. certainly. And it, it's, it's just insane. Safe place for Jews. My my president says that I'm in, I live in like the safest place in the world for Jews in the world's only, certainly biggest superpower that exists. And he's telling me that if not for that little place there, that is literally a war zone, that's the most dangerous place for Jews, that wouldn't exist if not for the evangelicals, uh, America, and that's what's keeping me safe, that that's safety. I mean, this is black and white. It's pretty People, precarious. It's pretty precarious and it's irrational. Once irrationality comes into the picture, then anything goes, and that's scary. It's scary. Yes, we could envision a cause and effect chain of events where, yes, 
people, anti-Semitism grows because people get frustrated with the Zionist nonsense that anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. All do of you, this do you, do you think? Do you think that American Christians, for example, because they're the largest contingent of you know uh, Christian Zionists, should support the state of Israel? No, I don't think they should. I think that, look, I can't tell them what to do, what, what their religion says. The reason know? I ask is because, you know, what? I, I, I went through a period where I took uh, Christianity very seriously and, and I obsessed over it for quite a while. And I suppose by, depending on your definition of the durability of salvation, I may still be a Christian. That's a theological interpretation. Okay. Um, but there is a part in Revelation I, I mentioned to you in one of our DMs where it talks about in uh, those who say they are Jews but are not Jews. Now, there's a lot of ways that that can be interpreted in Christian theology where they say, uh, you know, Christianity as a replacement theology says that, well, the Christians are now the extension of the original Jewish template or prototype. And so we're not ending Judaism; we're just changing it or transforming yes. it with a new covenant. I've heard and that. And so, so it could be that Judaism is not Jews, or it could be maybe that this the Zionist enterprise of a, of a, of a state claiming to be Jews but are not Jews are invoked in 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 Revelation. Now, you being a Jew, obviously, I, I you know you I don't think you can commit to that as being truth because it, wow. it's not Judaism. But but I think for Christians who are in trying to interpret this, they want to act in good faith. Uh, what do you make of that? I mean, is that is that a way for them to say, maybe, maybe this is not, I mean, I, I don't want to manipulate. You know, the, you know okay. Yeah. You don't, you yeah. don't I, I, I don't, I, I don't, I'm completely untutored in terms of interpreting verses from the New Testament. We don't believe in the New Testament. To us, it's a book written by people, and, you know, that's all. Right. Uh, so I, I don't know what to tell you over there. I, I don't yeah. know what their religion says. As far as uh, politically supporting Israel, I think that the best thing for Israel, and there are a lot of Israelis that say this, that Israel needs to stop being dependent on other countries. Uh, I say that Israel needs to become normal like every other country in the world. People think that it is. And Zionists keep talking about how Israel is singled out for this and for that in areas where they're not singled out at all. Um, I don't think there's a double standard that people use with respect to Israel. Um, I've answered all those Zionist talking points. Um, but there are places where Israel does claim to be different than all other countries in the world. The biggest example, and everything is downstream from there, that Israel claims to be not the country of its citizens, but the country of some nationality called Jewish, which means the result of that is that we're not the country of people who are not Jewish, that are our citizens. The result of that is that we can't have a, my, a majority uh, um, who are not Jewish. The result of that is we can't make Israel into just take the West Bank, take Gaza, make it all into one big Israel, give one person one vote, separate church and state, and become like, I don't know, Canada or whatever. We can't do any of that, all because of this crazy ideology. It's not normal. Israel is not like any other country in the world. It needs to become normal like other countries in the world. And I'm not talking about their behavior. Yeah, forget about that for now. I'm talking about the founding ideology that drives the, the philosophy of their country. It's called Zionism. Zionism has got to go. Zionism is poisoning Israel. You want to know if they'll change their name? You know, when I say this sometimes, so somebody says, okay, so call it Palestine. Hello, if it's a democracy, let the people decide what to call the country. I'm not going to tell you what the country should be called. Call it Charlie. I don't care. 
one person, one vote, freedom of religion, separation of church and state. It, you even don't keep have the to name. Anywhere. Even keep the name. You even can keep, keep the, the name. name. Again, whatever the people want, let it be. Problem is that Israel claims that that's not Israel. You're, you want to destroy Israel. That's it's the propaganda. We need. We're all being. We're, we're we're like running around like chickens without heads, chasing Israel's arguments without understanding what Israel is, what its philosophy is. You know, people are busy, like you said. Oh, it's the only Jewish state. There's twenty Arab states. No, it's not a Jewish state. It's a completely different concept. Everybody needs to know this. That is the problem. That's where our efforts should be focused. If Israel become a normal country, you know, people think that it's not normal because it has to do with religion and it's different, it's eschatology, or, or it's, it runs according to the Jewish religion, or the Talmud, or, or, or the Holocaust is coming, or there's terrorists. All of these things are not the problem. They're not the issue. The issue is Zionism. You cannot have a normal country that's not the country of its citizens, yet claims to be a democracy. I'm not the one that says this. Mayor Kahana said you can't have a Jewish state and a democracy. We Jews are a separate people. Otherwise, there's no point to being Jewish at all. Then there's no point to an Israel, a Jewish state. I, I'm no fan of his, but I agree with him on this. John Kerry, on, in his last speech he made before he left in the Obama administration, he said the same thing, that Israel has a choice. It could either be a democracy or a Jewish state, but it can't be both. Here is a fundamental reality. If the choice is one state, Israel can either be Jewish or democratic. It cannot be both. Let people understand that. But, you know, my, but Israel emphasizes the only democracy in the Middle East. Not only read the, also a democracy, it's the only democracy in the Middle East. And it's the only place where Arabs could become Supreme Court justices. This is all maybe true, but it's there's not a the point. There's a documentary. So I, yeah, I'm sorry. there's so a docu more. there's a there's a documentary I watched not too long ago. I mentioned it previously. It's called The Settlers. And there's I, a I quote in, there's a there's a quote in there where where someone says, uh, you know, this idea of democracy is is has only been around a couple hundred years. Maybe in another couple hundred years, it'll be gone. Yeah, Shimon Dotan, I think, was the, the guy that made that one. Um, right. The settlers don't want a democracy. Okay, settlers have a vote. If they want, let them make their own country. Or, but it, it, they need to do that. Everybody told them that. But Zionism is the problem. And it involves the definition of a Jew, anti-Semitism. They're confusing everybody. People are debating when is anti-Zionism, anti-Zionism, anti-Semitism. When does anti-Zionism cross the line into anti-Semitism? It never does. Anti-Semitism is anti-Semitism, and anti-Zionism is anti-Zionism. Anti-Semitism means you don't like Jews because they're Jews. Anti-Zionism means you don't like Zionism or you don't like Israel. That's it. It's very simple. Instead of all of this debating and people banging their heads against the wall, we're just being distracted from the issue. The issue is we need to dismantle undue Zionism, to expose it. That's all. When I, whoever I speak to, they're shocked when they hear this. this it's, it is, it's, it's quite shocking. Uh, not just in the, the, you know, um, the exposure of it, but in the scale and brazenness of it, it's, you know, yeah. the, the big lie. It really is a big lie. It's not a small it, lie. It's massive. And, and maybe and, that's, maybe that's why people get cognitive dissonance. They're like, I can't, there's this, how can that be something so, so fundamental being just hijacked? You know, it's also because there are anti-Semites in the world and, and there, there is this mystery of what Jewish identity is and, why does anti-Semitism exist? And there are easy answers over here and things get mixed up a lot. It's education. People need to be educated. But I got to tell you, I, I, I don't see this whole business with, you know, one state, two state. I don't see, I don't see this discussion going anywhere. I don't see it leading to peace. I, I 
myself, I would really suggest that we attack the philosophy that's causing this problem. Nobody gains by it, not even the Israelis. It's not even a question of the Israelis versus the Palestinians. That's a result of the problem. The problem is Zionism versus normalcy. Rabbi, I know we've gone over time, and I don't want to, I don't want to keep you longer than you want to stay. Yeah, I gotta um, go. I gotta um, go already. But but if I can, if I can just ask you this one question, Michael mm-hmm. Rechtenwald asked me to pass it on to you. We discussed mm-hmm. it earlier. Maybe you can just address it. Uh, and I think you've probably answered part of this already. But uh, I'm just going to read verbatim what he sent mm-hmm. me. Ask him how, why, and to what end Zionism represents a hijacking of Jewish identity. In connection with this. Ask him if the Jewish identity it did hijacked did not already involve a kind of supremacism, even in what he's characterized as its humility and offstandishness. So probably the second part of that. No. That's the answer. No. Okay. <laughs> That's the short answer. Okay. Um well, I could I could go on, but we have gone on quite a bit, and I think it's been a very fruitful conversation, Rabbi. Um, is there anything more you'd like to say? I don't want to keep you. No, I, I just... Even just in wrapping up? Yeah, I just want to say that people need to educate themselves. People like to talk about politics and how many people were killed and bombed, and all of that is important. I, I'm not dismissing that. But if we want there to be peace, we need to really focus on the philosophy that has caused Israel to be different than a regular country. And the only way to make peace, unless they divide things up into two states, which I don't see how they're going to do it, is for Israel to become a normal country. And the only way it's going to become a normal country is if we dismantle Zionism. If it can't be done, there are security issues, then, you know, I'm not, again, I'm not King Solomon. I can't solve every problem in the world. So I don't know what the solution is. But at least we need to try. I know we're being distracted from it. We're being distracted. Our attention is being focused away from where the problem really is. And we need to, we need to, we need to focus on where the problem is. Well, I see um, in today's media environment, there there seems to be a opportunity for people to become more aware. There's a you know there's a propaganda war going on, and I think that it's not as watertight as it used to be. Um, I see chinks in the armor. You know, Candace Owens having be- uh, Norman Finkelstein on the Daily Wire. That's not a small uh, thing. Um, you know, I see Glenn Greenwald doing great coverage. I see more awareness coming through. Now, I don't know that this is going to turn this round of conflict into the last one, and suddenly everybody's going to be singing "Kumbaya." Mm-hmm. But I, I, but I, I do see a trend towards more awareness, and hopefully, uh, people like yourself can get the word out more. What's actually happening, and. Um, just I don't know. You know, you say we that Zionism should be dismantled, maybe, and I hate that term because uh, I've I've been uh, you know dismantle is one of those terms that's sort of like uh, destroy. It's a trigger for it's a trigger for the right when you say dismantle. It sounds like this uh, systemic racism, these things that are uh, anathema to the right. There's a conservative Zionist. Uh, contingent that that seemed to be the the last piece of it. You know, the left is all very critical of Israel, but the right is not. And I've been hunting for what is the the argument that's palatable to the right. And I think that just exposing the truth about what Zionism is could could take care of that. So I don't want to say dismantle because that sounds okay. like some of this postmodern rhetoric. I but- got some. I got some more words. If you don't like dismantle, okay. Um, overturned, repealed, rescind, reverse, retract, or taken back. How's that? <laughs> okay. All done. Okay. So any any or all of those. Right. Um, but I, I say maybe there's a chance that we can uh, take another look at that and find a way to make that happen without 
existential threat to Jews or to Palestinians or to anyone. And maybe we can just find a way to peacefully take it apart a little bit at a time. Maybe it's just by maybe the media gradually does its thing and normalizes the idea that if we don't need to uh, contribute to this war, Israel starts to negotiate with its neighbors a little more in earnest because it doesn't have unlimited bombs and funds, you know, and then people start to talk and they say, Hey, you know, I don't, I don't kind of like this thing anymore. And, you know, maybe, maybe Jews start to move elsewhere. I don't know. Or maybe, or something happens politically, maybe Netanyahu is gone and there's a new government that come. you know, some, maybe it's some gradual process. Maybe it, it, it goes away the education. way it, it, came, it came, it came, you know, well, maybe not with a Nakba, but it's education. Edu- it's education. education. That's yeah. people. If so long as you got guys talking like Dershowitz, so so long as you guys thinking, people's thinking that Israel's a Jewish state and that's normal, or that Jews are a nationality and that's normal. Uh, you, you're not going to, you can't, there's no way out of this. It's not a regular political problem. It's not like the Vietnam War or something like that. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I miss the days when we could talk about something less contentious like transgenderism or Donald Trump. <laughs> remember, <laughs> I remember when those were the things that would drive people crazy, and now it's the, the smaller issue. Um, okay, Rabbi. Um, I don't want to keep you anymore. I tend to ramble on when we get close to the end of the conversation, so I don't want to. I don't want to trap you in that. Do you? Do you want to maybe make I, a final I, statement? No, that's all. We're good. Thanks so much for having me.